What's up, you guys? That's not going to make anybody mad. Asa. <laughs> <laughs> no one at all. Uh, welcome one and all to uh, my channel to uh derek's channel at myth vision podcast and to uh josh's channel at digital hammurabi it's friday Me april the megan's 12th channel? may oh it's megan's channel sorry but i mean she yeah. lets you she lets you play with it sometimes right sometimes sometimes so this is this is one of those times gentlemen uh it is it's it's just after five uh pacific time the right time uh, and we have a special treat for everyone this evening. So, uh, how are you guys doing? Josh? Yeah, doing well. Doing well. Um, nice. So, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> what was I think that? We're all, you're going, who's introducing this thing? <laughs> I, I i guess uh that, that's true i guess we uh i, I thought i maybe we did say derek should introduce it didn't we yes well, derek is kids are interviewing derek josh the... now <laughs> uh, derek I do is the hostess with the mostest ladies and gentlemen welcome to myth vision and today yeah no serious uh josh everybody get josh a slavery book this is the introduction i wanted to say subscribe to kip davis he has turned into the actual animal with a capital A. Um, and then, of course, can you say, uh, Kip, can you say who want that smoke? Can you say that for me? <laughs> I I'm a Canadian. I actually can't. So who I'm sorry. Yeah, who want that smoke? <laughs> hey, sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. There we go. Sorry, That's Derek, my introduction. Go I'm going to take a nap and you guys have fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you have. Hey, you have to deal with this stuff as much as we do. So yeah. you're in this fight just as much as we are. It's true. It's true. I kind of feel like well, I got pulled into it. Well, yeah. So I don't know. So, Derek, you throw in as much as you want. Um, but I guess, man, what was it a month ago now? Uh, we all started getting yeah, emails or tweets or uh, well you know where where it started was Josh and I are actually on a we're one of the group chats we're on is with um uh Zach Miller over at your pastor what your pastor doesn't doesn't tell you or what your pastor didn't tell you sorry Zach I butchered that and he's the one who threw the link in there to this video right that's where I saw it the first yeah, time and then it got like 20,000 views in like a couple of days, right? Yeah. And so this video is by Gavin Ortland, uh, PhD. Is it in philosophy? That's terrible. I should know. I think that. it's, I think it's philosophy. And I believe it's I, I know he four. wrote his dissertation on like the theology of Anselm or something. Um, that's terrible that I don't have that memorized. That sounds right. Um, yeah, but uh, and we said you know from Fuller or Wycliffe, it's one of those places, right? Yeah, man, I can't remember. Um, but you know, seems like a really nice guy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he's you know articulate. Um, but he put out this video on slavery, and and essentially, uh, you know, w what we've seen for the last five years now, um. You know, he, he maybe came at it in a, in a couple of ways that were slightly different than what normally happens. But I mean, overall, it's it's just it's 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 the argument that we have come to anticipate, I guess, is the way to say it. But it got a lot of traction, which, hey, you know, like, good for him. That's that's great. Um, but uh, I, like I in particular started getting emails from friend and foe alike saying you have to review this right uh, some people are saying you have to review this so that you know you can change your position because he <laughs> utterly destroyed you others well of that's course, fun yeah not that i way, love to but... utterly destroyed all the time yeah yeah that's how i roll you know so <laughs> um but here we are so what what we have done um, and Derek, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm stepping all over your toes here, man. You're not stepping on anything, please. <laughs> um, what we have done is the, the video was like an hour, what, an hour and 15 minutes, something like that. 
There's like the first 11, 10 or 11 minutes are sort of an introduction uh, that talk about like he doesn't like the word indoors. Um, he, he has like, he's, he's trying to do a balanced approach to this, which I, I appreciated. Um, but I feel like in Kip, you said something to me about this. It was sort of funny that like in the beginning, it was like, this is kind of what we see from apologists and, you know, we, we don't want to do that guys, you know, we need to do it differently, but then sort of ended up doing it, um, in a lot of ways. So, you know, when I first saw the video, when I started watching the video, I think it was in that first three, four, five minutes, I was actually kind of like, oh, because of some of the things that he had said to start with, right? And Gavin's looks like just a super approachable, soft-spoken, yeah. thoughtful kind of guy, right? Oh, that it, it it was very disarming uh, right in the beginning. And and a lot of what he said, like he said, you know, he he one of the things... That, that he points out in the introduction of his video is that there's been a lot of misplaced Christian rhetoric, apologetic rhetoric around this issue of slavery. And I'm like, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Right. And then it kind of went down. Yeah. yeah and, and my only role in this, so everybody knows why Josh isn't stepping on my toes we're in a secret society that we get paid from. It's another one on top of the Illuminati where we have our private conversations and they were like, look at this video. Um, you know, this guy never mentions anything by Joshua Bowen in this, in this, what's going on in this video. Almost like Josh, you don't exist. And you're, you're not the public face of slavery in the ancient near East in the biblical context the go-to goat when it comes to this topic. And you just don't exist in anywhere in this critique or anywhere in assessing this topic, which in the public face of things, I think it speaks volumes. And there seems to be awareness of your work as we talked about. But so I just said, let me go on Twitter. Let me invite, because you know I will talk to anyone like I'm willing to. Um, and there are some people I just, well, I'm not gonna say anyone. There's some people I purposely avoid. Like I just don't think there's any good faith dialogue in in some cases. But this guy seemed very kind, like you guys described. I sent the invite, and uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know, Derek. I, I keep hearing. Sorry, I, I I keep hearing that the only people you ever talk to are all those <laughs> cherry picked atheist scholars, right? And that's it. So. I'm being paid um, roasted. to keep saying this thing that I'm saying right now. And if I mm. say otherwise, you know how that like well, they'll cut my check in half. I can't. And before Big anybody starts, money, you know? but before anyone starts freaking out, don't worry. We're all still cashing the Illuminati checks as yes. well. <laughs> That's not going to so change. Those, those haven't stopped. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're still we're still flush, guys. Exactly. Sorry, exactly. Dark. Well, <laughs> continue. Well, what, what I have done is I've, I've, we're gonna, we're not gonna look at the first 11 minutes. I made like a, I, I, tr I cut off the first 11 minutes and I cut off, oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Claude Simeon. Excellent, yep, from Fuller, you got it. Um, oh, good, and I remember they had something, that's good. Um, so the, we, we're, we're gonna skip over the first 11 minutes and around the like 45 minute mark, uh, somewhere around there, he goes to the New Testament. Now, none of us here are New Testament scholars. We all have New Testament training, but I think it's I think it's better for us to leave, uh, given sort of the gravity of this video, uh, as it's been sort of foisted upon us. Um, I would like to see a New Testament scholar handle the New Testament early Christianity side. So. Maybe we can help organize that. Derek, do you know some New Testament? I don't know. You know, one or two, but probably just um, just the rotten atheist ones, though. I bet. No, yeah, yeah. no, no. The Christian scholar that you introduced me to, Josh, and that is Jennifer, um, uh, not Jennifer Glancy. Grace, or, yeah, Jennifer Glancy, I think it was, or it's the other Jennifer. There's two Jennifers, I think. I, I mean, Jennifer Glancy has literally written the book on. Yes. This is, is this Jennifer Glancy's new yeah. book, the second edition. It's a lot bigger, and okay. I'm like, I don't know, 60 pages in, and my God, it's just, 
she knows what I'm she's talking like, about. I'm like swimming in her analysis of Epictetus, which is anyway. Um, so anyway, so I'd like to leave that to uh, Jennifer Glancy or Ronald Charles, you know, somebody like that. Anyway, um, Jennifer Bird, you know. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do about a 34 minute video. It's like the meat. Uh, it's going to take his, uh, let's see, it's like four of his six points. Um, and it's going to basically what we're going to be focusing on is the Old Testament material and its comparison to the ancient Near East. Because I think for me, we'll talk about some other stuff, but that's the meat for me that I think he gets wrong. Um, and I think it's it's like the linchpin in his argument. And it's not just his argument, right? But this argument about like progressive incremental um, you know, revelation or God condescending and dealing with mankind where they are to bring them along, that sort of thing. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of poke holes in that uh best that we can. So um uh so I have this edited video, it has little stopping points that I've put in the middle, but um yeah, so there are places to stop, but you guys feel free to stop me whenever you want. Um, and Derek, this is just as much your stream as ours, man. So like you jump I'm, in I'm, and I might jump in here and there, but I really, really do want to let you guys run the show. All right. So I'll be back. All right, well, I'm just kidding. With you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Skip, whenever you're ready, you can share the screen. Oh yeah. Let's and, do uh, that. And we will get rolling. All right. I have six points I want to make. Number one, slavery was taken for granted nearly everywhere in the ancient world. Number two, Genesis 1 made a huge contribution to human equality through its doctrine of the image of God. I'm going to call that the Imago Dei. Uh, number three, the Old Testament law was never designed as a timeless ideal. Number four, the Old Testament law made significant improvements upon slavery in the ancient Near East. Number five, slavery is inconsistent with the New Testament's portrayal of the gospel. And number six, the uh, abolition of slavery in the modern world has a huge debt to Christian influence. Okay, so you can see where he's going, right? This is his roadmap. I think he laid this out very well. Mm -hmm. um, but like these are the, these are his six points, right? So these first two, uh, they they're they're pretty big chunks, like three four minutes a piece. So we'll 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 play them through with the goal of just playing each one through, and then commenting on it. Uh, of course, Kip or Derek, if you guys want to stop at any point in it, just let me know and I'll pause it. But this is where he's going. Um, these two, in my opinion, as we get there, the first two are uh, red herrings. Okay. That's my mm -hmm. critique of this, right? There is this, there is this um, strategy in dealing with problematic texts in the Hebrew Bible of zooming out and trying to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's look at the big picture here. And that's what I think um, sort of characterizes this video. Right, it's there's a lot of time spent in the beginning, saying we got to think big, got a big picture, big picture, theology, 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 right? And only then do we kind of zoom in here and then come back out, and zoom in there and come back out. Mm -hmm. There is no serious engagement with the text. That's my critique here, and that's the real problem, right? And we'll get into more detail, but just big picture here. This is my issue. There's no real serious engagement with the text. And the scholarship that he cites is either very um, theologically motivated and not from subject matter experts or is incredibly dated and really doesn't take into account, in some cases, the full scope of what those sources are saying. So, but we'll get into that. But that's where we're going. Um, so, Kip, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that before we get into the first point? No, I think we can just, uh, yeah, that was good. Let's, uh, let's just roll it. All right. I leave a couple seconds for the screen each time. 
There was. Like Slavery was basically taken for granted everywhere in the ancient world. It's a universal part of pre-modern humanity. Gleason Archer says, slavery was practiced by every ancient people of which we have any historical record. He says it was an integral part of ancient culture as commerce, taxation, or temple service. But the, the, what I want to emphasize is, it's not just that slavery existed everywhere, it's that it was assumed everywhere. So it's just taken for granted. People like Plato and Aristotle, for example, they just think it's obvious. People are not equal. Some people are born to be slaves. And that's the general way of thinking. A few exceptions, but for the most part, slavery was seen throughout ancient human history and really pre-modern human history as like poverty. Regrettable, but inevitable. Okay. Now today it's pretty much the opposite in much of the Western world. Slavery still exists and it's growing in certain parts of the world. But most of us in the developed world agree that slavery is wrong and we see that as kind of obvious. So we're, we're living on the far end of this massive turn in the basic intuitions with which we approach an issue like this. And that's just really helpful to set some context because it's not as though human beings start off as a blank slate and then here comes the Bible and it's introducing slavery or something like that. Remember that verb endorse. Well, this is going to get really complicated really quick because slavery is already there. The Bible is coming along and it's starting a process that gets us to today. When I hear atheists railing against slavery in the Bible, sometimes it comes across as though they're sort of assuming that there was some secular alternative that should have been chosen instead. And I think it's a fair question to ask, where do we even get the idea that slavery is wrong? Uh, that's an intuition. If you, if you say, for example, well, it's just obvious. You know, I, this is how sometimes people respond. They say, it's just obvious. Of course we can see that slavery is a bad thing. But I think that's naive about the problem here. That wasn't obvious to the vast majority of human culture throughout history. Most, we only see that as obvious today because of a very specific process of evolution in human civilization. And that process differentiates us from most of pre-modern humanity and certainly from the animal kingdom. I mean, this is the challenge for the atheist is in our long evolutionary history, where did this idea of like universal human rights, that was never a thing. Where did that suddenly come in? Where do you get that from? I'm going to come back to that at the end. I'm not necessarily trying to resolve that point right now. I'm trying to kind of flag that because what I want to start arguing now is that Christianity has played a catalytic role in the process of us coming to see slavery as obviously wrong, especially through its doctrine of the image of God and also through its understanding of the gospel, what it says is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the, the concern just to make visible here is if you don't believe in that, you, you do then have to give some other alternative for what do you ground this belief in human equality in. And I'll come back to that at the end. I just kind of want to flag that at the beginning here. In other words, another way to say this is, you know, it's a fair question to ask, how could the Bible tolerate slavery? That's what I'm going to try to address now. But it's also fair to ask, how did it ever come to be that there's a society that doesn't tolerate it? That's a bit of the story I want to tell in this video. So, <laughs> um, is it just me? Or was that, and I didn't catch this the first time around, or the second or the third time around, but is it just me, or is it kind of a strange point to make that one of the things that separates humans from the animal kingdom <laughs> is slavery? Uh, <laughs> like, that's a good uh, thing, or something? Like well, like... The way he had, the way he had, had, uh, yeah. The, so the way he was, he was, um, uh, couching that, it sure sounded like, uh, like the, uh, you know, the animals. What one of the things that separates us from animals is that we don't, we don't per pursue slavery. So, but I don't know. It was weird. I thought that was weird, and uh. Everyone should know anytime you're starting your argument with Gleason Archer. Uh, <laughs> bro, so listen, listen, no, no shade on, uh, on, on Gleason Archer. He was a, he, he was a, 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 you know, a fine Old Testament scholar, uh, did his work at Harvard. Uh, but 
guys, this was back in the nineteen the nineteen forties. There, the, a lot has happened since the nineteen forties, Josh. I mean, a lot. You've published two books on slavery since since nineteen <laughs> since nineteen forty two. So. Yes. Well. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I agree, and you're going to see in this video. We're going to point out in a couple of different places, um, actually with some animation, some of the issues that we have yes. uh, with some of the sources. But I want to try to steal man, at least this, this. I mean, obviously the whole thing I want to steal man, but I think we need to kind of do it, these first two points, right? So if I can, and you guys push back on me if you think I've missed something. Essentially what it seems like he's trying to argue here is that it's, it's, it's everywhere. In other words, um, you know, ancient Israel under his perception, I imagine, um, is that, you know, God, God brings the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt into the, into the land of Canaan, um, with these laws, uh, given on Sinai. And these laws are not stepping into a vacuum. In other words, uh, it's, it, it's, it's not stepping into, a you know, uh, this, this situation where there aren't any laws, there aren't any, you know, and, and God is just handing laws down or there aren't any pre-existing you know, um, uh, practices. And so th this is why uh, I struggled with one of the things here. It, he, he said, it's starting a process to get us to today. I'm going to, I'm going to hammer home that how much I disagree with that. Um, but secondly, the Bible didn't come along and introduce slavery. And when I heard that, so sorry, I want to steal man here. So the Bible doesn't come along and say, hey, slavery's great. Let's do that when no one else was doing it. Everybody else was doing it, right? So the Bible is starting on that foot. It's, it's, it, God is coming into that world with his law. And so the argument that Gavin is going to make here, and again, it's, it's not dissimilar from what others have made, David Webb very recently, uh, or more recently, um, and, and others uh, like him, that uh, God is condescending to humanity, specifically to Israel here, and saying, look, I want to slowly get you out of this. I can't do it all at once. Um, and so I'm going to incrementally or bit by bit slowly move you in the direction of slavery bad. Okay? That's what his argument is, as I understand it. Um, so then the second part, and then guys, shut me up and you know, but the second part then is when he says it's a fair question to ask, how did the Bible, um, like how is it, uh, first of all, that we know or we think, we believe that slavery is wrong as a people today. Um, and and uh, it's a fair question to ask, like, what do you base that morality on, right? And why is it that we're, we, we moved out of slavery at all? Right. And th there are two things built in here that I see. One, I think it sounds like this is somewhat presuppositional apologetics, right? Or at least it, it, maybe not presuppositional, but it certainly um, sounds like, uh, you know, this is an argument, obviously, from objective morality, uh, maybe divine mm -hmm. command theory based in you know, God's commands that are coming out of his moral nature or whatever. I don't know. Not my field. Um, but then turning it back on the atheist or the skeptic and saying, well, how do you, why do you, th how can you even say that slavery is wrong, right? This is why, and this is my critique here. First of all, this is a straw man, right? Nobody is arguing that the word endorse in this content, nobody of repute is arguing, certainly not us, arguing that the word endorse means that the Bible came along and created slavery. Like nobody that I know makes that argument. Um, secondly, uh, I wanted everybody to notice how quickly from the beginning it moved off of the topic of slavery, if it even got onto it, to, well, how do you know that anything is wrong anyway? What's your moral grounding? Right. Right. This is, to me, whether he means it or not, is insidious, right? It's this, it, it, like, stick to the goddamn topic. <laughs> It's what I wanted to say over and over again to this video. Gavin, like you seem like yeah. a super nice guy, but like I'm saying to the video, like, oh my God, just do slavery. Stop saying, well, how do you know? I mean, it isn't like, anyway, 
um, this, th these are internal critiques that, um, that atheists are doing, right? Or skeptics are doing. All right. Last thing that I'll say here, um, uh, it's not debated that everybody took slavery for granted. Everybody knows that slavery was, was taken for granted in the ancient world. It's, it's part of what's going on where we're going to push back hard. This is where I land. Um, is that it's starting this process to get people out, uh, to where we are today. First of all, I think that's, uh, I don't know. That's going to be the thing that he's going to have to defend here. And his major uh, linchpin in this video is that the Hebrew Bible is presenting laws that are so much better than the rest of the ancient Near East is going to fall apart. Yeah, it is. Okay. Sorry, guys. Go ahead. It, it, no. I can't wait to see the evidence, of course, that you're going to present that's comparable, which you've done in your book. But it's like in our discussion today, you can give examples or, or cover some of this. But I'm literally recording today. My brain is mush. That's why I'm thankful for you guys. Uh, this video on like, does Yahweh exist? And some of these philosophical mm. and biblical critical ideas that kiss in this documentary that I'm producing uh, is an uh, argument called the polymorphic projection. Ultimately, and he goes through so many, I mean, the political setup. Is it not ironic that Yahweh's even the language of Yahweh's temple, Yahweh's political setup in heaven and the council looks so much like the other ancient Near Eastern deities, and those setups look a lot like the human constructs. We, we go through everything, cosmography, cosmology. In every aspect, it seems that the deity, even speaking from the biblical text, does not see the, the limitation of the deity's knowledge and understanding is limited to the authorial pen. And, and it can't see beyond that. Well, what does God have going on in heaven? Instruments that just so happen to be first millennium BCE instruments. Why is he not rocking a guitar? He's flying on, on, on chariots with horses. Why is he not running an, a jet? What, why, are they, why is everything kind of dated to these kind of concepts? And slavery is no different. And so my observation is just saying, when you look at every category, mythology, syncretism, the list goes on and on, you see slavery also in the same avenue is what the Bible's doing, similar to what we see in the rest of the ancient Near East. And so it's special pleading to me up front, right out the gate, with my flavor of religion and foundation is true. Scratch every other society and culture that has morality that predated, that coexisted and postdates biblical text anyway there's my little yeah thing, so. yeah i think we should uh we should we should continue on with uh with the next point but before we do i thought i'd share a couple of things um uh, jennifer Silves has said i think uh dr kill and dr josh should start wearing clown noses when doing these we love to hear slavery is bad so keep it up but these guys are responding to are clowns i i can't say i disagree but I don't know if I'm I'm ready to go out and buy myself a clown nose either, so I, I don't I don't have one, and my 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 David Falk fat face stick is too far away to grab right now. So, um, Ralph Thompson has said that the Bible does not condone the transatlantic slave trade because how could it? You know that was hundreds of years later, right? That was man stealing or human trafficking, which is not approved of in the bible uh ralph we are going to certainly get to um uh, stick get around to this stick around exactly but for now i think uh i think josh I'll, i'm just gonna i'm gonna bring uh the video back and cool. uh we can continue with that Point number two, Genesis 1 made a huge contribution to human equality through its doctrine of the image of God. And it's legitimate to prioritize Genesis 1 and 2. Because when you're trying to understand the Bible, uh, you want to see what is God's ideal at the very outset. Even if you don't think these chapters are historical, this is what the text is putting forward as the original plan before evil comes into the world in Genesis 3. And in Genesis 1 and 2, there's no thought or possibility of slavery. I think sometimes people fail to appreciate how much of a step forward Genesis 1 through 2 was relative to other ancient Near Eastern understandings of human beings. 
uh, I'll say it, say it succinctly here. It's very common in other ancient Near Eastern creation texts for the royal figure of a particular culture to be seen as in the image of a deity or the image of the deity or the offspring of a deity. One of my, I wrote an article about this 10 years ago that I'll link to where I'm trying to, that's kind of what I'm saying. I'm saying basically there's interplay between the idea of image and offspring, but that's a separate point. Comment. Right now, I just want to document this a little bit that the idea of Genesis 1 was very radical. Just, just Sorry, I am not quick on the draw. You're good. <laughs> I'll raise my hand to kind of signal. My question is, um, why why was Adam created? Wasn't he created to till oh, the, the ground? Yeah, in the garden? I, yeah. I mean, I mean I, uh, anyway, I mean, what the hell's going on here already? Anyway, sorry. Teed it up for you, Kill. You certainly did. Should oh, I get into this? Basically. Or uh, no, no, you I, want to finish the clip first? Can. Yeah, let's just uh, finish sorry, the clip, I didn't mean and then to. I can. No, 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 no dude. You're, 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 you're a bright guy, Derek, and Thank I mean, you, you're bro. tracking with with how people should be uh, reading the text, right? So we'll get there. Uh, but let's the just Genesis finish the clip, and we'll talk. This one was saying everybody is made in the image of God, and that was a that was a, a step forward. Uh, just to give a few examples, I think seeing some of the context in the ancient Near East helps us because uh, it helps us not just read the Bible against modern Western democratic values, but to see it in its own time, how radical it was. So for example, I'll put up four examples from Egyptian texts and inscriptions where you can see various pharaohs spoken of as the image of a deity. Uh, if you want to go into more of those, you can read my article. And in each case, this is talking about a royal figure. By the way, if you another book that goes through this that's really good that I derived a lot from in my own work on this is this great book by J. Richard Middleton called The Liberating Image. Amazing book. You can see pages 93 to 145 of that book. He goes through all these Egyptian examples. I think he goes through like 18 different examples. And he mentions there are some others where the Pharaoh figure is portrayed as the image of the deity. And uh, I could only find one text where it's applied a little more broadly than that. In the Babylonian creation myth, Enuma Elish, you find this idea of creation in the image of a deity, but again, it's only applied to other deities. So here's an example from very early on in the, in the first tablet there. The human beings are not the image bearers of God uh, here. They're created to do the menial labor. They're like underneath the gods doing the grunt work. You know, that's human beings in this text. And so people love to talk about parallels between Genesis and these other ancient Near Eastern texts, but there's differences. And one of the differences is Genesis 1 gives this more exalted view of human beings. I'll put up just a few other examples from a, an ancient Assyrian epic called the Tekulti Ninurta epic, where you can find, I, I, I'll just quote from my article here, I won't read through this, but you can find two Assyrian kings talked about as the image of a particular deity. And again, it's just the king. And I, in the article, I go through a few other Mesopotamian documents to, to but the, the point is, the Bible takes this idea, which was kind of a common thought in the ancient Near East, and democratizes it. It's not just the royalty that's in the image of God. Everybody bears God's image. In other words, metaphorically speaking, everybody is royal. That's a radical idea. We often take that for granted today. Historically, that was not self-evident. And, and throughout Christian history and, and Jewish history, you can see that idea, that radical new idea, coming into clash with alternative ideas. Um, for example, Celsus, the critic of Christianity in the second century, one of his criticisms is, you guys elevate human beings too highly. He said the radical error in Jewish and Christian thinking is that it is anthropocentric. They say God made all things for man, but this is not at all evident. And his own view is, perspect is evident in these words. He says, in no way is man better in God's sight than ants and bees. That's a very common ancient way of thinking about human beings. We're like bugs. <laughs> we're, uh, we're like insects, you know, not particularly valuable or exalted. The cre idea of creation in the image of God was this lightning step forward. And I'm not the one who's, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you're aware this is an argument. This was the doctrine that, 
it was like a hammer in the hand of the abolitionists in the 18th century. They just, I'll come back to that at the end of this. And I'm sure you're familiar with people like Tom Holland and his amazing book, Dominion. He, he I, I'm not trying to say he's would agree with everything I'm get, going through right here, but he does talk about this, this, this modern value of equality. And he says the ultimate seedbed of this idea was the book of Genesis. More on that later. So. Okay. Um, yeah, Genesis, Genesis one and two, this idea of, of man being created in the image of God. Um, so I, I happen to have been doing some, uh, some writing on, uh, on these topics, uh, particularly recently. So I, I've spent, uh, devoted individual whole chapters in, in the book that I'm currently writing on individually, just the first and the second creation stories in Genesis chapter one and two. And like on the face of it, I think this sounds like a convincing argument and in large part on the basis of how uh, this idea of the image of God, I think probably developed into the Christian period, right? Following the, after the, uh, the, the, the writing of the new Testament and into the church fathers, and I think I think this is this is probably very much the same uh, for for uh, the the early Jewish uh, now I, sorry I should say the early rabbinic uh, Jewish commenters on these texts as well. But what is important to point out is within their original context, Genesis chapter one and two don't don't fit cleanly into this idea into how uh, Gavin Ortland wants to read these texts. And I thought maybe the best way to just kind of unpack some of the problems with his reading of Genesis 1 to 2 is just read a little bit of what I've written uh, on on this uh, on on these these passages if if that's okay. Am I good to do that guys? Yeah, definitely please of course. yeah. Okay, so uh, this is in my chapter about uh, the first creation account when I start to talk uh, specifically you want to share about. You it on the screen, so they I can see it. I could do or... that too. Yeah, let's maybe uh, let me do that. So I think I have to take that off. Um, yeah, uh, I think I have to share the entire screen for this. Okay. All right. So uh, this is where I, I specifically start start in my section on. Oh no, that's the wrong chapter. Let's go to uh, let's go to chapter uh, seven first. This is in my section on the Imago Dei. There, and I'm not going to read from the beginning. Uh, I'm I'm going to start here. What is the image of God? What are images in the Hebrew Bible and in other ancient Near Eastern literature. In order to answer these questions, we need to spend some time looking at how these words that I've translated form an image are used more generally. So first in verse 26, God proposes that they make man in their tselem, and you read that right, but at this point it shouldn't bother you to see that God is not alone here. This is a proposition that takes place in the Divine Council. The word tselem is used elsewhere for figurines and statues of other gods, what we would describe as idols. The form of God, then, is a representation of God's being, but importantly, this is a physically embodied God. For example, in 2 Kings eleven eighteen, 18, this is how the destruction of statues to the gods are described when the people of the land conducted a raid on the temple of Baal. All the people of the land went to the house of Baal. They pulled down its images and its selamim, the, the selam in plural, they smashed to bits. It's pretty clear what's being described here. A selam in this passage is an idol, a figurine or a statue. This is in line with the instruction by Yahweh to Moses in Numbers uh, 3352. I won't bother uh, reading that. Uh, I'm just going to skip ahead here to the other word, the second word, demut, which I've translated as image. This word is used in a number of passages with reference to a model 
or a drawing. For example, in 2 Kings 16, verse 10, it says the king Ahaz went to meet tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, in Damascus, and he saw the altar, which was in Damascus. King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest a demut of the altar and its plan for its work. In what follows, we read that the priest in Jerusalem builds a copy of the altar that he had seen in the plans for it, and the king that the king had sent to him from Damascus. So the word here is like a detailed sketch or a drawing. Elsewhere, in particular in the book of Ezekiel, it's used literally for the, the faces of the uh, of the divine creatures. And I think that's probably more in keeping with, with what's being communicated in Genesis 1. I actually think this is like the visage, the face, and the, the form of God in which uh, in which man was created. These words used together, Selim and Demut, the form and the visage of God, are more akin to a combined depiction of his actual being similar to idols and images of the gods, which were common throughout the ancient Near East. We understand that statues of gods in the temples or the small figurines, hundreds of which have been discovered in archaeological excavations throughout Palestine and Israel, are not the gods themselves but they are representative of who the gods are, or for our purposes, more precisely, what they do. On earth, the gods live only in images, as in the king, the king in, as an Im image of God, in cult images in the temple, and in sacred animals, plants, and objects. So the gods were part of the world, but very distant and capable of presencing. That is to say that they specially derived images were conduits through which the gods were capable of manifesting even from such great distances. As my friend Dan McClellan has put it, these societies understood deities to be in some way uh, able to inhabit material media and reify their presence through that media while the primary locus of their presence was understood to be located elsewhere. So in this respect, when a man is imagined as quite literally the statue and the face of God, this is not metaphoric. These words signal that the mortal man is presencing God for the purpose of enacting God's function. So what do we do with this expression? To let us make man in our image. It's quite similar to those used with some frequency in a selection of writings that were inscribed on stele in the early to mid first millennium BCE. Neo-Assyrian victory stele were pillars erected by kings after successful campaigns and conquests in foreign regions and cities. So these columns were set up over a ruler's newly conquered territories as expressions of royal power and to declare might and dominion to those among the conquered who question it. There's a couple of nice examples of this from Ashur Nasirpal II, who was an Assyrian king from the 9th century BCE. I'll just read one of them to you. At this time, I fashioned an image of my own likeness, the glory of my power I inscribed thereon, and in the mountain of Edi, in the city of Ashur Nasirpal, at the source I set it up. There's a few more I've got listed there. I won't bother reading them. So here's the point. There is a strong relationship between the erection of these monuments. It's fun to say erection, guys. The erection of these monuments bearing the image of King Asher Nasserpal, his enduring presence, and his subjugation of those places where his visage chiseled stele stood. These columns are visible expressions of victory, and the image and form of the conquering king stands over its subdued region as a constant reminder of his presence and his dominion. It's menace. It's propaganda. God's charge to the man in Genesis 1.28 makes it abundantly clear that his role as God's form and visage is to enact his supremacy, bring the earth to heal. The English translation of this word subdue uh, does not vividly capture what God is demanding. Most often, it's used for submission of a conquered people, people into humiliation and slavery. More disturbingly, in Esther, the word appears to describe what King Ahasuerus thinks to be a sexual assault on his queen. Would he dare to rape the queen with me still in the house? So here, God instructs the man to put the natural world in its place, on the heels of a resounding conquest, which resulted in the order and structure of creation. It's a violent, 
rapacious picture of a domineering God lording his victory over the captive adversary. So that's Genesis chapter 1. Um, and I think this is an important point to make, even though this is an idea that developed much later into something else. This isn't where it started. So if this is God's ideal for humankind, we need to think and we need to carefully consider where this was first uttered and why it was first uttered. So it's not a it's it's not a, a happy picture of of equality and freedom for everyone. This is this is about uh, uh, doing the domineering God's bidding, and in uh, in as I said, uh, putting the natural world under your heels. As is it, were. it safe to say, too, guys? I mean, it sounds like what you're describing is historical cultural milieu. What the zeitgeist of of the actual context is. And that's what I love to do, as you know. But we've got theology versus what we're dealing with, the, the actual context. And mm -hmm. even in the original context, when I'm reading this text, I'm still seeing while Adam represents the first man in this mythos, there's still a sense in which while it may be this man represents universally mankind in some way, Notice immediately there's a tract genealogy that directly lines up to a certain national people, a special chosen people in the narrative function, and mm. they are uniquely called out among everybody, right? So th there is a, what you mentioned in your book, I saw propaganda, the word there, I'm thinking there's like a propaganda, get, propagandistic function on narrating this origin story that just so happens to make your people be the ones and if we were to consider their post-exilic or even exilic context for the origin of this myth they're not in a place to be kings so <laughs> i That's imagine if they were in power true. how much different would this story had been it would it look like these neo-assyrian uh, understandings probably more so than being the subdued ones underneath who have to kind of have this imagination if that makes any yeah sense, you know that, I, mean? I think that's a very good point actually um in terms of of helping us to locate this this text historically and attempt you know trying then to to unpack why it might it might uh uh um couch this image in the way that it does so see you're good at this derek I just listen to you guys enough, Good. and then I think about things. And I'm like, should eh. I say something quickly about Genesis two? the The bit that I wrote on on Genesis two and three is a lot shorter, but I think I think so. Uh, and the point you made the point well, Derek. Uh, I noticed a couple of people picked up on this in the chat as well. Um, humankind was created specifically for for work for enslavement. In the Garden of God, which is in Eden, uh, Bruce Wells is writing on this topic as we speak. Like this is his 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 focus, as I understand, of a lot of his research going into his new book is in the direction of, you know, the ad the Adam and his woman are like oblates in a like a temple garden or an urban garden. So I will uh, I'll I'll do this one. And then we can uh, we can get back to the video unless Josh maybe has some some other things to to share just to just to finish up this point here. Uh, so this is from my my chapter on uh, Genesis two and three. It says in verse fifteen, the Adam's purpose is made explicit. He has been taken by Yahweh and settled in the garden to work and to watch. One of my favorite English translations, Jewish Publication Society's edition of the Tanakh, renders this to till and to tend. Uh, and the picture is of a man farming the land. But there is an added significance to the usage of these two words together. The first word is frequently used with the plain meaning of work, and the second to keep or to guard. But both words also carry with them cultic connotations. Both words are used often of the Israelite priestly group known as the Levites to describe their service to Yahweh specifically in the tent sanctuary in the nomadic tribes long before the permanent dwelling of Yahweh in the Jerusalem temple had been constructed. It appears in Numbers 3, 7 to 8. Uh, on another interesting translational note, the word 
in both places that we commonly see as work in our English Bibles is the Hebrew word avad, from which the noun evet is derived, meaning slave. Genesis 2, 5 and verse 15 are quite clear about this. The Adam's purpose is to serve the ground. The Adamah is literally the word from which he was formed. There was no man to work the soil. This purpose is accomplished by his service in the Garden of God. Yahweh settled the Adam in the Garden of Eden to work and to watch it. In an implied sense, the man is a slave to the earth. This is a theme that was picked up later in the story, but for now his enslavement is confined to the limits of God's garden, the Garden of Eden. And I, you know, I I I'm I, I talk a little bit about this as I go on, but oftentimes we we get this sense that when God created, when God planted Eden, it literally says that this was for people. But no, this was God's garden. Ezekiel actually makes that explicit by calling it the garden of God in Eden. And, you know, as his garden, as his uh, place for repose, the, the humans were placed in there for the specific purpose to look after it, to keep it, to make sure that Yahweh didn't have to work too hard. What else should we call that? Josh, doesn't this bring like a different meaning to the whole ashes to ashes, dust to dust kind of thing in a way? It makes you think like I am a slave to the earth as as a man in this myth, right? Uh, because he's actually tilling and, and that was the duty or the role of the guy in agricultural situation. But everyone gets buried or at least they have the, the idea of shale going into the earth. And so there's this like built into the whole the way they probably view things is the slave concept to the earth, his actual duties as a slave in the garden to the deity. Uh, but just the idea of going, returning back to the earth, I am trapped to return mm. back to the earth period. So guys, we have a decision to make here. <clears throat> uh oh, point three is, uh, I think it's like six minutes. The clip is like six minutes long. It still doesn't have anything to do with slavery. It's the Matthew <laughs> 19 section. Oh, uh, folks, I'm not kidding. I think in the actual video, 26 minutes go by before you talk about slavery. In an right. edited video, that's not great if it's a video about slavery. Just want to put that out there. So I'm thinking that maybe we skip that section just because we're almost at the hour mark. What do you yeah. think? And I, I can summarize I, it. I'm totally on board with that, and I think it's it's worthwhile just just summarizing this. I so I did like uh, th th this comes up a lot. Uh, this this idea the the Matthew 19 um, ethic is is that uh, you know on on the teaching in Jesus's teaching of divorce, he makes this point that the law for divorce um, was you know, made because of the hardness of the people's hearts, and he has a better ethic to replace it. The, this gets a ton of traction among evangelical apologists, and they apply it to everything that they do not like. It's hyperbole. It's like hyperbole. Yes, it's like hyperbole. I did a whole, I did a, a, a lengthy stream on Tyler Vela's channel over at uh, the Free Thinker podcast about um uh, a biblical violence, genocide, and atrocities in the Old Testament, responding to a video that started by making this exact same point that because of Matthew 19, um, we can see um, what, what's called a redemptive movement out of... Uh, I, it's not all happening at once, right? But uh, things are progressively getting better. So even if it looks bad in the Old Testament, don't worry. Uh, God's fixed it in the New Testament. And if anyone's interested in a video specifically on that marriage section, I did a live stream with mm. uh, Jennifer Grace Bird, and she goes in on this because it's in her new book. Jen, but, yeah, Jen's good at killing things. Big time. So let, let me say this because I think it's a good segue and, and we can put the video back up and I'll skip through uh, real quick. But um, here's the thing about the Matthew 19 principle, okay? Um, 
it's about divorce, right? It's fine if somebody wants to try to say, look, this is a principle. Maybe we can look for it to be applied elsewhere in the law. The problem is you either have to show that connection to slavery, you can't, or, and probably more importantly, you want to show how it's actually happening, right? It doesn't really mean a lot. And this is where I think this video and this argument, again, not just Gavin, right? Because this is not Gavin's argument. Gavin is presenting an argument. So like, I'm not coming after him, right? In that regard. You have to show that the Hebrew Bible is taking a step forward. And then you have to show ostensibly that the New Testament, the early church are taking a step forward because that's where this principle is supposed to be applied. But it doesn't. And if you have any doubts about that, please pick up Jennifer Glancy's book. Talk to Pat Lowinger, who was in the oh. uh, the chat earlier. I don't know if he's still chat here. Earlier. Yeah, he he might have very suffered happy to talk to you about an this. aneurysm from... <laughs> from seeing what what was on the screen already yeah uh, if he's still there yeah so that's what we're Great going to point. be a, that's what we're going to be attacking here right we're not going to yep. get into the new testament stuff we'll, we'll, we'll mention it a little bit but we'll leave that to new testament scholars what we're going to be pushing back on hard is that the hebrew mm -hmm. bible is making some huge progressive leaps when it comes to slavery it's just not so if if you want, Kip, you can pull that back. Yeah, it's not spoilers. <laughs> uh, let me. But just I've, one step at a time. I've, I've put little marks. Jump up shellfish or something like this. Step and, it? I did. Very good. I can I can mute it while you're uh, while you're finding your spot. Let's do that. So, uh, just a note to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for. Uh, for throwing your super chats in there. We will get to those at the end. And I'm committed to sticking around uh, to answer questions if, if, uh, if people want. So yeah. Are we good? Okay. Yep. So hopefully that's clear. Okay. Now let's dive in fourth nice, section of the video. Nice tr transition. Josh, the old Testament sweet. made significant improvements upon slavery in the ancient near East. And I'm actually going to call it generally servanthood. I'm not saying we can never use the word slave. This gets really complicated. How do you even translate the, you know, in the English we have slave, servant, bond servant in different translations. This really helpful lecture by Peter Williams goes into this and he basically, he, he gets in, uh, I'll, I'll link to it as well. He gets into the lexical issues of uh, and how much the translations have changed over the years toward the beginning of his lecture. It's really helpful. But the important thing to note is just how much variation there is in how slavery has functioned or servanthood has functioned throughout different cultures. And so the vocabulary becomes really important here when we hear the word slavery. Okay. <laughs> how do we decide how to translate a word from Hebrew or Greek? Kip? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> usually context helps a lot. Uh, and not just like not just the, the 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 biblical context, the way lexicographers work, the way that that we uh, decide or or the way they 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 come to decisions about what a word means is by basically uh, exhaustively examining word usage across the ancient world uh in that specific language every text that they can get their hands on in order to see how this word is used in this specific context with these particular um uh prepositions or, or or conjunctions included in this particular clause or phrase that's how we decide uh how to translate a word did i miss anything josh no and here's the thing folks specifically when it comes to the word slave Here's the problem. It's like the word run, okay? Yeah. It's very easy to equivocate. I want everybody to, let's all say it together, equivocate. It's, oh, oh, just equivocate, equivocate. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Three, sorry. Two, one, equivocate. Equivocate. <laughs> we practice that now. We're so good um, at this, guys. So look. You should start a band. 
if you look at any, and this this is the other critique that I have, right? I, I ju- and I'm not faulting him in a sense for this because it's not his field, right? But but it, he's not engaging with scholarship uh, on this topic written by subject matter experts. He's just not, right? At least as far as what I've seen. Um, so if you read, like Laura Colbertson has an edited volume that I keep bringing up all the time because she has in her introduction uh, this great little footnote that talks about like uh, this, all the scholars that lament about defining slavery. What she means by this is that the word evet or the Semitic wardu or you know, like this Semitic word that is used uh, for like a male slave has it's polysemous, just like so many other words, right? It has multiple meanings. It can be used in a wide variety of contexts, like the word boss, right? Hey, man, <laughs> as Michael Scott would say, that's my boss. The, that perm is boss. Those shoulder pads are really boss, right? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so it can mean like the guy that or the woman that's actually in charge of me, uh, or it can mean like, hey, what's up, boss? You know, like your friend or... Uh, it can be something that's really cool. The word slave is used in a wide variety of contexts in the in the ancient Near East uh, in general and in the Hebrew Bible. So it can, it can you, you'll hear people say this all the time. So Moses is a chattel slave. So Joshua was a chattel slave. So so God, you know, so Jesus in Isaiah fifty three is a chattel slave. You know, miss me with that shit, right? right like, right, tell me right. you don't understand how lexicography works without telling me you don't understand how lexicography works. So the way that we determine what a goddamn word means is the fucking context. The context, people. The context. And I Like, I've said this so many times. Please stop coming back at me with this bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, like... I just, this riles me up because people want to soften slavery. And the way that they do it so often is to say, well, I mean, you know, they did it this morning in a discussion I was listening to. Well, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, uh, Hmm. kings could be slaves. Every, you may, owning a credit card is like having a slave. Shut the fuck up. God. Like, so what we're going to do in this, yeah, I mean, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at the context. We're going to look at these passages that have this word, and we're going to say, what is being described? We do not come to this backwards and say, okay, what are all the different ways that Evid can be used? What's like the common notion? Well, like being sort of like under somebody or something, and then apply that to these passages. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. No, you, I no just, Jeff, I, you have to get it out, man. Me and Kip, there's a reason we're doing the video again. I mean, for those who don't know, Josh, you've been fighting this for years now. This is your thing. And me and Kip, we have our different interests, but like we can get in the fight with you and put on the gloves, brother. So notice I called you brother. You're not my biological brother. That's right. I mean, how dare I use a word that <laughs> does not have... I equivocated there. I screwed you up. You equivocated. That's right. Damn oh, it. my gosh. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah at what you just said. Uh, we often think of what we've seen in our context. For me, as a uh, someone in the United States, we think of the transatlantic slave trade from the 15th to the 19th centuries. We think of slavery in the American South prior to the Civil War. And we're th- that's what comes into our mind because that's what we know of. And this is one of the most despicable forms of slavery to ever exist uh, in its scale and its brutality and in its nature. It was race-based chattel slavery. So chattel slavery means the slave is the legal property of the master. And it was explicitly race-based. The way people defended it was by arguing that one race is superior to another. So this is a particularly egregious form of slavery, though I'm going to say all slavery is bad. All slavery reflects the fact that we're in a fallen world, but this is like one of the worst forms ever. That's that's not the same, despite what people will claim, and I'll address the pushback in a second. That's not the same as what we have in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the general basis for slavery was economic. Okay, you have a subsistence economy. Can you pause it for a second, Josh? There's not... I feel like this gets brought up, and it's a red herring 
the amount of attention that Christian apologists want to uh, put on this idea that in the Old Testament, it wasn't race-based slavery. So much better because it's not race-based, you guys. It's way better because they weren't racists back then. Are they not xenophobic, tribally? I mean, it's because they're foreigners. (laughs) (laughs) Anyone who's not part of the covenant is, is free game, you guys. So it wasn't it's, based uh, on this thing that hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <sighs> okay. We should continue. A lot of safety nets. If you can't pay off your debts, this is one way you can survive. All right. Oh, look. Yeah. <laughs> you anticipated Oops. this. Therefore, what? Memorize it. When you, when you, and I'm obviously talking to the audience here. When you encounter someone that says this, ask them a question, therefore what? Because what would he say? It's okay? Because it wasn't race-based? I hope not. I mean, he said earlier, right? Uh, and uh, this is, this is nothing more than trying to wash down, to to, to whitewash, to soften up, coming into the text, right? Coming into these passages, whoa, 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 we can't make these connections to the antebellum South. Yeah, you can. And in fact, one of the things that I tried to, yeah, yeah, I mean, they did, right? I mean, like, look at the laws. How do you think they did that? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and we'll talk about it, but I mean, like, sure, yeah, I, I like, so I, I, I write about it in the book. Um, but please, everybody, go pick up Thomas Morris's book on slave laws in the antebellum South. He goes through the colonial period. He goes through the, the post revolution. Goes to the antebellum South, and look at the laws about slavery. They'll say things like "No good Christian would," and then they'll say. Hmm abuse or murder their slave but for moderate correction the rights to beat the slave must be maintained by the master sound familiar bible yeah i mean i will say this i really appreciate about people like gavin um and people like that were uh, doing theology in the abolitionist movement, they're starting at least from the position that slavery is bad. Thank you, Gavin. Yes. yes. You would not believe, yes. Gavin, how many people do not begin there today. How many so Christians? Thank you. Yeah. How many, how many Christians? Christians? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so crazy. thank you. I would much rather somebody be liberal with the text, progressive with the text. Uh, and say, you know what? Let's 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 zoom out. Let's not focus in on these these other pa- let's let's read them in light of passages about freedom. In that respect, if I've got to make the choice, please do that. So, yeah, I, yeah. I do want to I do want to say that. Can I add one little observation please. about God? And it's only like a few sentences. It it's something I noticed today when I did my script is that you have people who believe God loves everybody and they have such a loving God. And I think it's a reflection of them. I think it's a mirror of a good people. They're good people and they want a God that reflects that good nature that they aspire to even greater goodness of themselves. But textually God hates God causes evil. I mean, like I can make the case Calvinists have swallowed this pill. So when you have Calvinists who aren't shying away from the problem of evil, because God created evil, God does evil. Yeah, he causes evil. whoop de doo Mm -hmm. They accept the ugliness of the text. I like the Christian who's willing to wrestle with his theology, wrestle with the tradition, and even if, if he has to confront it or she has to confront it and say, I reject that notion. That's not my God. I don't care if the Bible says it. I don't accept it. Jennifer Bird's book, when she talks about permission granted you know to to say you know 
God abhors workers of iniquity, Psalm 5, 5. That's not my God. Or God hates Jacob but loves Esau. That's not my God. God hates people, causes evil. That isn't. My God is good. If they're going to take a path, that's the better one. Pertaining to slavery, you know, there's some ugly stuff. And there's ways I figure theologically they can get their head around, but at least acknowledging that ugliness and not trying to whitewash it and pretend yeah. it's not there. Let's yeah. be honest with what's going That's on. Right. That's right. Here's uh, th this is uh, how Jay Sklar puts it. He says, in the ancient Near East in general, and in the Bible in particular, debt was commonly the reason for entering into servitude. By the way, if you want a good commentary on Leviticus, he has an older one that's smaller, and then he has this uh, more recent one. I'll link to this in the video description too. I just try to recommend helpful resources. He's my favorite commentator on the book of Leviticus, and he tr has some helpful treatment of this topic too. So to try to give one Wonder. example of some of the differences here, we shouldn't think of ancient Hebrew servants as doing the grunt labor rather than the master. On the contrary, both would be working. That's the kind of world you're in, in the ancient world. I just want to pause it here for a second. Everybody should go read Seth Richardson's work um, on slavery in the old Babylonian period. Uh, he's got an article, a lengthy article. You can get it free on um, academia. I can't remember the title, sorry, but it, it, it essentially shows that slaves were used uh, as fungible assets, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that, it carries over, uh, I think, pretty clearly in the rest of the ancient Near East. Um, but uh, so they're, they're used as like credit, movable credit, right? Um, so it, it this isn't this isn't a, again. Therefore, what, Gavin? Ask yourself that. Therefore, what? So they're they're made to work, and the owner of the household also has to work. Like, well, therefore, what? They're still slaves, right? And the biblical yep. texts are pretty clear, right? Uh, read through the Proverbs, read through Job. The life of a slave ain't all that great, right? And what we'll, 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 and that's obviously saying that very, 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 very mildly, right? Um, anyway, I, I just this this bothers me. But yes, please read that because. Um, the, the reason that I brought up Seth Richardson's work is he's making the argument that the slave's real value was not in their labor. We're not talking about like plantations here, right? These are household slaves. Their real value, he argues, um, and actually we see this elsewhere in the antebellum South, as it turns out, um, at least it's argued, not my area of expertise, but um, that there's a, a, there's a certain amount of like liquidity it's probably not the right way to describe it, but uh, if somebody were to, to, to give you a loan, um, property was not alienable in the same way that a slave was. So you'll see slaves pledged all the time, right? It's probably what we're looking at in Exodus 21, 20 to 21, 26 to 27. Mm -hmm. These are probably debt slaves that are pledged, right? Or people that are pledged. And those people can be converted to chattel slavery if the if the the debt is not repaid within a certain period of time right throughout the ancient world and that that you know anyway that probably factors in here but the point is that their real value was not necessarily seen in their their labor but the fact that they could be credit so anyway just something to to bear in mind here this is not this is not the flex that i think gavin thinks it is Chris Wright says Old Testament servants were residential domestic workers complementing, but not a substitute for the labor of free members of the household. In other words, slave labor was not a means by which free Israelites were released from physical labor, as was the case in classical Greece, for example. Slaves also were treated with rights and with dignity more so, I'll show in a second, than other places in the ancient Near East. So, for example, here's how it's put in the Anchor Bible Dictionary's essay on slavery. We have in the Bible the first appeals in world literature to treat slaves as human beings for their own sake and not just in the interest of their masters. So I wanted to put this up on the screen. This He's, he's citing Dandamayev, Muhammad Dandamayev. It's a wonderful article. I would recommend everybody go read it. This is one of the few things in the article that I disagree with, right? And of course, the, the this is in 1993. Uh, I, it's around 93. I don't remember which volume, you know, what year this particular volume was published. But I just wanted to put the whole context here 
um, on the screen. So not this is something that I don't know that Gavin would want to read live on his or on his video. Non-Israelite yeah. slaves were legally considered movable property of their masters who could dispose of them as they wished. Slaves were supposed to be in fear of their masters, Malachi 1.6. In a number of biblical passages, slaves are listed as part of valuable property alongside with cattle, gold, silver, etc. A number of proverbs and aphorisms have been preserved which show a contemptuous attitude towards slaves. A slave ruling over princes is out of place. Mere words will not discipline a slave, since he does not respond even if he understands. A slave pampered from boyhood will become ungrateful in the end. The case when a slave becomes king is listed among things which the earth cannot bear. A similar case is when slaves are on horseback and nobles go on foot. Nonetheless, slaves were not only the object of law. Thus, the fourth commandment contains an interdiction against forcing the slaves to work on the Sabbath. So you could force them to work, just not on the Sabbath. It seems, however, that these instructions were often violated since some biblical sources condemn uh, the breach of the Sabbath. We have in the Bible, here's the quote, the first appeals in world literature to treat slaves as human beings for their own sake and not just in the interests of their masters. I don't actually know specifically what he's referring to, I think it's probably Exodus 21, 20 to 21, but thus slaves both born in the household and those bought with money, just like the free Israelites were to be circumcised in order uh, to share cultic life and eat the Passover. Maybe that's just what he's referencing. Um, the Hebrew law also restricted the master's power over his slaves. Premeditated killing was considered a crime of punishable by law in cases where the slave died immediately from the beating. We're going to show that this is the same in the rest of the ancient Near East or in other places in the ancient Near East. So, um, yeah, anyway, I just wanted you guys to see that in its context. And obviously, that's not the whole article. Again, this is section D. I highly recommend that Don Demaya's article is fantastic. Did you guys want to say anything about that? I just... My ears perked up when I heard him say that little section, and I'm like, "Like, let's find the prettiest part I can, pull that out. We have in the Bible the first appeals in world literature to treat slaves as human beings for their own sake, and not just in the interest of their masters. Yeah, and, and like, I, I disagree with this, mm -hmm. right? Like, Right. Yeah, sorry, I mean, it's not just Israelites, but they're saying the first. I wonder if any of these ancient Near Eastern uh law codes better yet um emphasize or at least narratives about slaves where they're treated in a, in a certain fashion that seems like they have some even some dignity or some personality in those contexts that's it almost sounds like that because i don't really get what that means as human beings for their own sake like what what are they trying to say in this yeah, I, I just, I, you like this thing about being circumcised or sharing in cultic life or eating the Passover, it means they're part of the master's household, right? And and, and like, so these were, yeah. th th I, I just, even even if we were to interpret this as, hey, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Kip, sorry. Even no, I, no, no, sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to say, like, the th I think the thing that... Uh, the the problem I have with uh, with Dan, what Dan Damayev says in this sentence is that it it makes a presumption of what constitutes a human being that I think he is overreaching for the ancient world, right? Because I think uh, n nobody was. I, I think there's a point that that continually needs to be made is that. Like in terms substantively, uh, qualitatively, in some respects, I don't think there was there was a sense like like within the ancient world there wasn't this idea that people were subhuman, like somehow, um, like metaphysically or biologically worse and lower, just as a result of 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 like biology um that everybody all people were human beings uh and really all that meant was that no matter who you were if you fell into dire straits you were in danger of the same sort of uh oppression and manipulation that uh 
that everyone else was subject to unless you were rich and ruling right like it, it just it feels it feels like a uh an overreach to me a conceptual overreach and overreach of the language it's it's like I, I it feels like it's a bit of a projection back yeah from a, a more modern concept of of human yeah. And again, it's in 90, like the early 90s. So, I mean, like we've, we just, yeah, go back to that. And we'll get into some more specifics here as we go through. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's my era, people. I'll give a few examples of this in just a moment from the Old Testament law. One of my favorite verses about this topic actually is in the book of Job. He's listing possible sins he could have committed, you know. If I, if I had committed adultery, if I had mistreated my neighbor, and then he says, if I had rejected the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they brought a complaint against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? You know, there's an awareness. You can't just treat your servant any old way you want. They're not, they're not chattel property. You, it's not like that. Yeah, that last line, they're not chattel property. Yeah, I knew you were getting it. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I... It doesn't follow, uh, and certainly the evidence does not bear out um, that just because someone is a chattel slave that the master can do anything that they want to them, right? And that's not just in the Hebrew Bible, that's elsewhere in the ancient Near East. But let's take this Job 31 passage, right? There's something that's like... Uh, the elephant in the room here and that is they're his slaves right so you i mean just because he's saying if they have a legal complaint a reeve uh against him that he does justice for them right he listens to it because god will call him to account if he doesn't answer the legal complaint that that the just legal complaint by the way you see this elsewhere in the ancient near east right like slaves could, uh, in, in the laws of Hammurabi, you see, um, uh, and I, 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 I don't remember the specific line, maybe, or maybe it's 278, I can't remember which law, um, but like a, a slave can, it might be 282, uh, but if a slave says like, declares, I'm not your slave, right? The master has to establish the case Right. And we see this in the documentation from the ancient Near East. Like I, I, I go through it in my book. But the point is that this isn't the flex that he thinks it is. Yeah. It, so here's what I wrote. So in Job's best case scenario, where he does not deny them justice in their legal complaint, he still maintains that they are slaves. This seems to work directly against the notion that since we are created in the image of God or formed in the same way in the womb as Job, um, that uh that there is no slavery right or that, that 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 like i don't even know what the therefore is there honestly yeah um at least in this case with job is it just that it's so, not yeah. as bad as it could be i don't know go ahead sorry Kip. he's making he's making the same mistake here as as what i think den is doing when he's when he's equivocating on human being right uh justice for a slave i think what's happening is you look at that word justice yeah. and we've got an idea in our modern world a concept of what that looks like and this is this is the way in which a lot of these apologetic arguments sort of work they look at a lot a number of these texts which talk about you know loving uh loving one another and treating your your neighbor or your friend with respect and dignity um uh looking after the sojourner in your land they look at these terms that appear in the text which are you know for for lack of a better word better word these are technical terms justice is a technical term within this ancient hebraic context of this ancient ancient israelite context and it means it has specific limitations to it right but they're not the same limitations that we would necessarily put on that word so modern 21st century justice for a slave is not the same thing as you know iron age justice for a slave and 
I, I think I made the point in the notes when when we we started putting them together for this video that like Job's what Job is talking about here uh, is following the law, basically. So where the law says you can beat your slave and if he dies after, you know, uh, four days, let's say Job beats up his slave and kills him after four days. But because it didn't happen in inside of one or two days, he's good. That's justice. Yep, I think that's uh, understanding where people's station was, right? Uh, yeah, is, is 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 something that I think gets missed here. Uh, mm -hmm. That's our our definitions are not theirs. But here I just want to push back against this claim that the transatlantic slave trade is the same as slavery in the Old Testament to a T. No, it wasn't. I think any honest historian would admit that, first of all, just in its scale and brutality, it was uh, sort of unrivaled. Okay, so I, I wasn't going to stop here, but I have to. Notice what he's doing. Awesome. That's Megan, everybody. Oh, sorry, it says Megan here. Um, Hi, Megan. Sorry, our audience is a lot smarter than I am. Um, <laughs> oh, notice what, notice he's doing. what he's notice what he's doing in its scale and brutality, right? What and and this this is common practice. Um, like I, I'm not necessarily like faulting him or something for, for this because I don't I don't know that everybody would think about it this way. What he's not going to do is compare the laws on the books in the antebellum South and the laws on the books from his lights uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Instead, as I pointed out so many times before, he's going to look at the laws in the Hebrew Bible and look at what actually happened in the antebellum South. And that's a big, like it's a big problem, right? Because you 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 can't say, look, they murdered people but here in the Hebrew Bible, it says you're not allowed to do that. Well, it said they weren't allowed to do that in the antebellum South, too. Like, that's a big deal. Because, as I pointed out before, people that argue, um, like, in defense of the laws about slavery in the Hebrew Bible, in many, many ways, those same arguments can be brought um, to the defense of the laws in the antebellum South. Yeah. Mm. I don't know anything. Listen, I, I I don't know much of anything about modern uh, slavery, except to know that it, it's still prevalent in many parts of the world. But like, I wonder, because he's basically making the argument here that biblical slavery is not the transatlantic slave trade, therefore better, right? It's okay. Would he make that same argument if there are, you know, with regards to modern institutions of slavery in our current modern world that look a whole lot more like, you know, ancient Near Eastern slavery and less like the transatlantic slave trade? You, you bring up an interesting point that let's paint a scenario because they want to go, look. You're not allowed to steal a person to make them a slave, right? But if we all as a nation chose to go and dominate a land because Bobby had a revelation from Yahweh and he said to do it, that hint, hint, William Lane Craig, Canaanite slaughter. Anyway, my point is we go and we kill and fight and dominate, but there's many men left. We just pretty much slaughter the hell out of them. Um, we can take those men, but that's not stealing because it was fair conquest, battle, and warfare. Let's take them as slaves now. Now, would Gavin get behind this kind of idea? I know this is straw manning him a bit because he's a Christian and he has an anachronistic theological outlook and, of course, the modern sensibilities and stuff. But you get where I'm going with this. Like, we could find a justified route that isn't necessarily just going over here and buying slaves off of others who captured them in their circumstance, which they may have felt at that time in history in their own little civilization as 
this was justified. But we're purchasing them, or we're do, we're maybe we're playing a part in capturing them. Just making the point. That's a no no. But we go over and fight a war, make it some legal justified battle in the name of God. We can then rightfully take them as slaves. Is that okay, Gavin? Like, what makes it okay? Again, therefore, what? Yeah, you know what I mean. So, yep. excellent point. I. I, I just have to interrupt you guys there. I, you see, you atheists, I just have to know where do you get your morality from? <laughs> oh, God, that was oh. weird, wasn't it? <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> wow. What was that? I don't know. What was? Th I don't know what that was. Wait, I, I'm going to let myself back in here. You see, when I sack a city... I know because of the word of God to take the virgin girls for myself. But what do you atheists do? Do you just, what do you do with the virgin girls? You see, it's just, it, this, this makes no sense. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What, what, what about those virgin girls? Wow. Fair, I, fair point, right? Game Two set shame, match. Apologist. Guys. Yes. <laughs> That was oh good. my god, I love him. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. No. Oh. How do we go yeah. on from that? Like I don't, we can't stop that. <laughs> <laughs> I I was I I had something I was going to say and I lost it, but that's I that's fine. You. We should just we should just continue. That was amazing. <laughs> that but was. more basically, um it's a different kind of slavery altogether. Just taking the prohibition of Exodus 21:16 alone, this would have made the transatlantic slave trade impossible. Because in the Old Testament, you get the death penalty for human theft. It doesn't say whoever steals a Hebrew. It says whoever steals a man. That's question, you get the death Josh, penalty. So I, I, I have a question for you, Josh. It's simple. Why are they making a law saying you can't steal people to make them slaves? Because people are stealing people to make them slaves? No way. <laughs> I'm being silly, of course, to make the point that if people are doing this, that would be the reason you'd make this law. So if 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 slavery in the contemporary world, you're not allowed to murder, but the people murdering and they're saying, but you can't, you're not like your point is it sets up an environment where people are going to go beyond whatever those boundaries you set up are anyway. Mm -hmm. And the boundaries in and of themselves are horrific for some, but I can guarantee you we could probably find examples in the antebellum South where certain slaves, I'm not even trying to act like the situation wasn't horrific in their status, but in comparison to other slaves, they might've had a better family that treated them with more kindness and such. If we were comparing evil to evil in the sense, you see what I'm saying? So uh, it just, it rubs me the wrong way. He's right in the literalistic technical sense of it's not identical in the sense of racism and stuff, but it could have been bigoted toward other tribes. Well, those damn Amalekites, mm -hmm. you know, you, they might've been in their own house talking about the Amalekites or those Philistine or, you know what I mean? Those uncircumcised Philistines. I mean, that sounds like a bigoted, guys. you know, so I listen. I I don't I don't know anything about uh, about the the transatlantic state slave trade. I'm just a dumb Canadian, but uh, I do believe that at one point, um, like like slave slave uh, slave trafficking uh, overseas became illegal, didn't it? 1807 and, i think but and that was a long time before slavery was outlawed right oh yeah yeah like i, I mean <laughs> distinction look distinction without a difference right like, i it, mean look like he, he, here's so th this is it right this argument the exodus twenty one sixteen argument this is mm -hmm. the argument like if there are three big arguments this is in my experience this is one of the like the, this is the top if not the top, like it's the it's first thing second. I on in in the Twitter cesspool. It's like the first yeah. thing I see. It's not race based in Exodus twenty one sixteen. Those are the two yeah. things you're going to hear immediately. Look, 
everybody, gather around. Come close, everyone I'm in the close. audience. You too. It was illegal to kidnap people everywhere. <gasps> No. Oh, so are you are you saying, Josh, that there was no slavery in the ancient? That's areas? right. That's it. That's what I'm saying. That's it, right? I can't. It must be it. It just necessarily <laughs> follows. If there's no kidnapping, there can't be slavery. Let me it read some of these. Slavery. Yeah. Laws of Ornama four. If a man keeps someone captive, this man will go to jail and pay fifteen shekels of silver. Laws of Hammurabi fourteen. If a man should kidnap the young child of another man, he shall be killed. Hittite Laws 19. If a Luvian abducts a free man, man or woman, from the land of Hatti and leads him away to the land of Luviar Zawa, and subsequently the abducted person owner recognizes him, the abductor shall bring or forfeit his entire house. If a Hittite abducts a Luvian man in the land of Hatti and leads him away to the land of Luvia, formerly they gave 12 persons, but now he shall give six persons. He shall look to his house for it. It's illegal to kidnap free people but therefore what um and kip i know that you want to say something even though it's sort of a, an ancillary point i know you want to say something about the septuagint of exodus twenty one sixteen. so please I, I love the septuagint what can i say i can so just I can there's feel a, it <laughs> you can feel it there's a i mean there's a revision of this law right in deuteronomy uh, where is it, Josh? 24? 24. Is, yeah. yeah, I got it right. I'm terrible with the numbers, guys. Uh, so there's a revision of this law in Deuteronomy 24, uh, which actually specifies that you are not to kidnap a, you know, an, an Ebrit, uh, Ish, a Hebrew man. Um, and then when the Septuagint comes along and, uh, and translates Exodus 21.16, it says the same thing that uh, it doesn't just say you sh you're not allowed to kidnap a man. It specifies this. You are not allowed to kidnap a son of Israel. Um, now, I think the that this this is probably as as what happens in the uh, in the Second Temple period as they're collecting literature together. One of the things that happens is they're harmonizing a lot of these texts. So m my thought is that this is probably what the Greek translator is doing is looking at Deuteronomy 24 and going, this is really actually what it means in in uh, in Exodus 21, 16. So I'm going to provide this clarification. Uh, I do know that now we talked about this recently and Joel Koryatko, who is a, uh, a Septuagint scholar actually pointed out he thinks this this could very well just be an alternative version of Exodus twenty one sixteen, mm. like a like a, a Hebrew forelog that that uh, the Septuagint translator is translating from. Both of those you know situations are totally plausible. I think the important point here though is that even though Exodus twenty one sixteen just says you shall not capture or or steal a man the spirit of the rule of the law as it was understood by the first readers of this text was that this applied to free hebrew men that's it that's all i got hmm. it just yeah come on guys um I just, it's, but it's can you do it to women? Free Hebrew women. Okay, sorry. That, that's, no. yeah. um, Exodus twenty four might actually might actually expand in that direction too. I, okay. I don't remember. Josh would know. But. It says if a man is discovered kidnapping someone from among his brothers, the sons of Israel, and he trades oh. them or sells them, that kidnapper must die. Who purges Israel from your no, midst, but, or the evil from your midst? Yeah. So uh, I'll I'll just say on the on the point of of women. Uh, Derek, um, in my opinion, I suspect that it, the the law is worded this way because women are not they're not on the same level, right? Yeah. As a course. free man, um, a free man is a is is a free man. Uh, a woman of any station is still uh, part of a man's holdings. It's part. She is part of property, so she would fall under. A different category, uh, you know. You're not allowed to steal uh, a a woman in the, in the same way. You're not allowed to steal 
you know, a cow or a goat or a, a Toyota four runner. So it, it, um, that I, I, I expect, you know, that's why we're back. Mm -hmm. But let me give some more specific examples where you can see the Hebrew Bible, even compared to other law codes in the ancient Near East is taking some steps forward. In other ancient Near Eastern cultures, you can find lots of laws where if you harm someone else's servant, you're transgressing a certain law and you have to make amends to their master and so forth. But in the, in the law of Moses, there are laws about how you can't harm your own servant. And if you do, you forfeit the right to that servant. That was relatively rare. You know, you'll find in like the Code of Hammurabi, an, uh, a Babylonian legal text composed in, during like the 18th century BC, um, basically permission for masters to, to like punish their servants uh, in these cruel ways, cutting off an ear, this kind of thing. That's the kind of thing Exodus 21 is reacting against saying, no, you can't do that. And this was relatively rare in the ancient Near East. Here's how the Jewish scholar Nahum Sarna puts it. This law, the protection of slaves from maltreatment by their masters, is nowhere else found in the entire existing corpus of ancient Near Eastern legislation. Here's how another scholar puts it. No other ancient Near Eastern law has been found that holds a master to account for the treatment of his own slaves as distinct from injury done to the slave of another master. And the otherwise universal law regarding runaway slaves was that they must be sent back with severe penalties for those who failed to comply. All right. So, so a lot before you do that, can I, I just I just wanted to I, I just want everyone to know that when we talked about putting this stream together, I actually thought Josh should just sit there with his <laughs> his book open to this enormous appendix that he has included in the book where he literally just lists all the laws, all the ancient Near Eastern laws pertaining to slavery. Um and where those laws are either the same or sometimes even better mm -hmm. than what's prescribed in the Hebrew Bible. Go ahead, Josh. If people are interested in that, um, that appendix, Appendix A, goes through all the laws, as Kip said, including the Hebrew Bible, and gives commentary on them. Um, and Chapter 5 of the book is a comparative analysis of all the places where there is overlap in the slave laws in the Hebrew Bible and those in the ancient Near East and gives analysis uh, of each of them and then gives comparative data. Yep. So. Um, Get the damn book. I do, I, I am proud of it. Um, so let's, let's see if we can go through a little bit of this. Um, so first of all, Exodus 21, 28 to 32 says exactly what Gavin is saying that it doesn't, right? Or saying that the Hebrew Bible doesn't do. Um, so if an ox, go, this is the, the sort of common stock law that shows up in several other ancient Eastern law collections and comes down into the Hebrew Bible. Um, if an ox is known to gore and the owner doesn't do something to restrain it, and the ox gores a free man or a free woman or a free child, uh, then the owner's life is forfeit. Now he can ransom it if the family wants to do that, like he can pay them to get out of being killed. But then the text says, if it gores a slave, 30 shekels of silver is paid to the master of the slave. Hmm. It's property law. This is precisely what the text, like this is, this idea, this is why Westbrook points out there's not unanimity, uh, unanimity, <laughs> there's not univocality um, in the way that even the law collection in Exodus 21 presents the idea of a slave. Now, I think there's probably a little bit of a, a nuance here, but nonetheless, um, like this is harm done to the slave, uh, the penalty uh, or the, the it, this is a a, a property. Um, God, I'm sorry, I'm tired. I've been up since like three, uh, and it oh, is poor Josh. what time now? Nine forty-five. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, but it's a it's a crime against the or it's a it's a an offense against the owner, and so 
remuneration has to be paid monetarily uh, to for essentially for, for the value of the slave. Okay, um, but here, let me just read to you. So Exodus, we can do this one from memory. At right? Exodus 21, 20, 20, if a man beats his male or female slave with a wooden rod and they die immediately or under his hand, uh, he will surely be punished. But if he survives a day or two, then he will not be punished because he is his silver, right? Let me just read to you laws of Hammurabi 115 and 116. If a man has a claim of grain or silver against another man, distrains a member of his household, and the distrainee dies a natural death while in the house of her or his distrainer, that case has no basis for a claim. If the distrainee should die from the effects of a beating or other physical abuse while in the house of her or his distrainer, the owner of the distrainee shall charge and convict his merchant. And if the distrainee is the man's son, they shall kill the distrainer's son. And if the man's slave, he shall weigh and deliver 20 shekels of silver. Moreover, he shall forfeit whatever he originally gave as the loan. These are debt slaves in Exodus 21, 20 to 21. Likely, perhaps, I don't want to say likely, perhaps that doesn't make sense. I think it's likely that these are pledges, right? Um, but the, the point is that these are debt slaves. These are not chattel slaves in Exodus 21, 20, 20, because there is a debt to be repaid. Mm. Um, and the, he brings up this point about the cutting off of the, we're going to go back through Exodus 21 more. So I, I, I'll leave it at that for now. But he brings up this point of cutting off the ear without specificity. He says in the laws of Hammurabi, I thought he might have been talking about the middle of Syrian laws, but just quickly, laws of Hammurabi 205, and if, if an Awilu, like a free man, if his slave should strike the cheek of a member of the Awilu class, they shall cut off his ear. I don't know if that's what he's talking about. I deal with that in the battery section of my book, Appendix B. I think it's probably Law 282. If a slave should declare to his master, you are not my master, he, the master, shall bring in charge, uh, bring charge and proof against him that he is indeed a slave, and his master shall cut off his ear. The cutting off the ear is the same thing that you see in uh, Exodus 21, 2, 6 putting the all through the ear. This is a mutilation of the ear in order to show chattel slavery. This is what's happening here, mm -hmm. I suspect. Um, this is a mark that either it's a chattel slave who is want to try to escape, which is probably what's going on here. And so he's being marked so that people, when they see him out and about, they can go, that's a slave because of the ear. You also had certain hairstyles, a hair lock uh, in the old Babylonian period. Uh, and probably other periods. I can't remember off the top of my head. It indicated when somebody saw somebody out and about, they could identify that person of a slave because runaway slaves were a thing. Uh, you also have in the middle of Syrian laws, A44, if there is an Assyrian man or an Assyrian woman who is residing in a house uh, as a pledge for a debt for as much as his value of that debt, uh, or sorry, and he is taken for the full value, he shall whip, pluck out the pledge's hair or mutilate or pierce the pledge's ears. Um, and what that means is while they're a pledge, while they're a debt slave, uh, they're there with a higher, like a, an elevated status over a chattel slave because they're not alienable. It's anticipated that they're going mm. to go back to their original status. Um, and so Westbrook's, I know this is a lot, sorry. Westbrook says here, this paragraph, the one in the middle of Syrian laws, illustrates the difference between the permissible treatment of sl pledges, slaves, and by implication, debt slaves. A pledge could not be punished by physical maltreatment or marked as a slave by piercing his ear. The same restrictions would uh, appear to apply to a debt slave. These measures applied to chattel slaves uh, uh, only, but at the same time, they acted as limitations since they marked the limit of what could be done to such a slave. In other words, it seems backwards, but the law is saying you can only do this much to your slave. There's not this huge difference between these collections. There's more, but I won't. No, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll save it for a little bit later. No, I, I think you've made the point. Yeah. One question on what you read earlier, where it talked about killing the, the, the person's son, or at least something there. Doesn't the Bible have kind of this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth idea where you're able to go and kill, like if someone killed your brother or your son or something, you can go and kill their family member you you like legally are allowed unless they end up in one of these um cities that are like refuge like they're able to mm -hmm. escape and they're in the safe spot but you're not allowed to kill them in that spot but like it's really 
archaic sounding the way that they kind of spell it out is my point yeah i mean i think what we are certainly looking at here is this lex talionis concept right this sort of yeah. quality of retribution um i did want to say from his sarna quote here uh well first of all the covenant code is reacting to that uh i wrote in the notes here please demonstrate that claim gavin that it's yeah. reacting that that's that's a pretty big claim um uh, I'm, I'm certainly not saying it's not possible, but I mean, like, you'd have to. You got to demonstrate the these things. You can't just assert them, right? So, and it might you... not be something that he wants to do. Like, I don't know that it's good for his position, but at any rate, yeah. um, Sarna's full quote here: "This law, mm -hmm. twenty to twenty-one, the protection of slaves from maltreatment by the masters, is found nowhere else in the entire existing corpus. Um, it represents quality." Oh, wait, he, he that was up on the screen. Sorry, this is simply incorrect. I wrote. Uh, and I cited laws of Hammurabi 116, uh, the one that I just read above, same with Middle Assyrian laws, and also Middle uh, Middle Assyrian Palace Decrees 18. Sorry, I'll shut up after this. Um, it's long, so I won't read it. But essentially, if you have a mistress who has a slave woman in the palace, the mistress, if the slave woman disobeys, she can uh, beat her, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, she can beat her with 30 blows with rods. Um, for the first offense. If she does it a second time, she has to bring the slave, her slave, before the king. And the king will declare what the punishment is to be. Just, I want to read this second part here. If the palace woman, whose slave woman she beat in accordance with the royal decree, is excessive and the slave dies from the blows or two, and then it's broken, the palace woman who has killed her slave woman shall suffer for her insolence. She is held responsible for a punishment, a punishable offense against the king. You can't just do whatever you want with these yeah. slaves. I'm sorry. It's just, that's not what's going on in the ancient Near East. Um, yeah, all right, so we, we should move on because... He's getting ready to go to Deuteronomy 23, which will be a fun. Okay. Fun. Uh, did I? I thought I. Oh, I, I took it right off the stage. Sorry, guys. Whoops. So that latter part of the quote there, uh, Chris Wright is talking about Deuteronomy 23 and the law uh, that was given to Israel that basically foreign runaway slaves are not to be sent back. Most of the other places, the law is the opposite. You're in trouble if you don't send them back, if you harbor the slave. Deuteronomy 23 says, no, uh, don't send them back. And then it, at the last sentence I like there, you shall not wrong him. And this does appear to be talking about uh, foreign slaves. I appreciate this part. Uh, of Paul Copan stuff. gives three reasons for that. There's no use of the terms brother or neighbor. Israelites weren't allowed to enslave other Israelites, according to Leviticus 25. And a foreign slave could choose which town he wants to live in as referenced here in verse 16, but the Israelites lived in lands allotted to I their clans. All three so this looks like basically, yeah. you know, if if some other, uh, a person from some other nation runs away, they're a slave, they run away, they get to Israel, now they have a safe haven. Can you imagine if God's people had consistently implemented this law, they would be the only safe haven in the world at that time for slaves. These are the kind of passages that get kind of glossed over sometimes. Okay, so let us let me just start with the positive here, right? This is fantastic. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, so often apologists want to say that this is every slave that runs away. It's not, right? Um, it's almost universally agreed upon that this is talking about uh, foreign slaves that are escaping into Israel. They're not supposed to have extradition treaties, which is what uh, and, and extradition treaties very commonly. Uh, you can read uh, Sam Gringus's work on this um, in his book, Laws in the Bible. Laws in the Fantastic. Bible. Um, uh, but this is so that they're not supposed to have these extradition treaties, these sort of parity treaties with the surrounding nations. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is about, right? Because they're not supposed to be equals or vassals right they're it's supposed a, to be it's the a head. treaty document that's right. like it, the book of deuteronomy is a treaty document in which yahweh is basically saying you're my slaves and here is how you need to 
to to fulfill this this covenant relationship that I've established with you. It's modeling. So it uh, it stands to reason you can't make treaties with with anyone else yeah. because you're Yahweh's. Yeah. And this law is almost certainly talking about, as Gavin pointed out, a runaway slave who's coming from another nation. Interestingly enough, they're not supposed to like take them in and protect them. They're supposed to essentially have a hands-off approach to them, yeah. right? Um, and we don't have to get into Just why. Go, that is. go want... somewhere so long as you don't stay here. You're fine, right. right? You can't stay in my house because if you read through the laws of the ancient Near East, as Gavin was sort of alluding to, if you harbor a runaway slave, it's like you've stolen them, which is bad news, by the way. Illegal to steal slaves, believe it or not. Um, but this is something that I I have not found anybody else that's written about this, uh, at least from this perspective. So I think this was one of the novel things in my book. Um, so in Laws of Hammurabi 87, which is broken, it's in a broken section, um, but the text reads, if either a male slave or a female slave, broken, they shall return him to his master. If, broken, he beats, and it's it, it looks like the word beats is here. It's, it's still in question, though. Uh, if he beats him, they will not return him to his master. Uh, that's how Roth translates this. Richardson translated it. If either a male slave or a female slave to his master, they shall return him. If something he has been beating him, they shall not return him to his master. What's that mean? Like bruised, like apparently injured kind of thing? That's what it... I don't know that the text is... It, it might be in the broken section. Right. Um, but I don't know that, that that level of specificity is being called out. But it, it's it's abusive, I think, is the the notion here. Like if right. he's been abusing him, beating him abusively. So um, if that's the case, and and I say this in the book, like we can't know that that's what's going on here. But this is this is interesting uh, because in the laws of Hammurabi, it seems like there's a good case to be made that you have the humanity of the slave being considered in this way, where if he is being abused, he is not to be returned to his master. So. Hmm. something to think about so i think i think that's an a, that's an important point to make josh more yeah. more globally is that within all of these laws uh there are protections provided for you know and this is part of why this is part of why uh these kings wrote these laws in the first place was as a demonstration of their um, of their power and their their greatness you you provided a a sense of I'm a civilized guy. I've got I've I've got this strong sense of justice that applies to, you know, all these people. This is part of my job. I'm keeping the I'm keeping the peace. I'm keeping the social order. Um and and importantly, many of these laws were protecting against abuses of all sorts of people, but critically. And this this just reminds me of the 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 thing that I got into with the guy on Twitter today. Abuses are not necessarily abuses in this world are not necessarily what we understand to be abuses that's right right there's variance here uh and ab abuse committed to a free israelite man is not the same as an abuse of you know uh a slave again there, there are ways dating. yeah there are ways there are there are are things that were perfectly okay in this culture that we would consider like egregious abuse mm -hmm. from a modern perspective right it's equivocating you're right derek yeah because i mean just because it's abuse here and they may be both in the category of it but it's like you know there are various degrees like you're describing that may be more horrific and it's yep. still abuse. It's just a different level. And and you you guys did an interview. I don't want to sidetrack because we have very probably some more stuff here. You guys did an interview where you were talking about um, one of the Christian apologists was talking about trading LeBron, LeBron James using slave language. Dude, that stuck out to me so bad. That was so good how you guys were like, 
why do we still carry over this language in sports when they're trading? It's clearly still like fossils he, in the language. It's a slavery. it's a relic, right? Of right. of this other world. Gavin's um, Gavin's gonna bring that up. Oh, is he? Uh, so someone makes an excellent point. <laughs> Have we considered Sorry. a hava? I mean, come on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Simone's one of our uh Simone reads Hebrew with us on every second Thursday night. But cool. Right. Now, in his response to Trent, at at twelve fifty of his response, Mindshift was saying that, you know, masters could treat uh, servants however they wanted, they could beat them, they could rape them, all these kinds of things. Yes, were there Israelites in the Israelite community that ran out of money and were going to starve and so they said, hey, because I have no other option and you guys are into this thing, let me come work for you for seven years. And that would almost be okay if it was a work contract. But the things that were allowed to happen to these individuals, you could beat your indentured servants as long as they got up the next day. You could totally mess them up as long as you didn't dismember their body you could rape them you could force them to do anything you wanted to very very few rules and you got to do that for seven years but this is clearly wrong just from what we've seen in exodus 21 alone we see no slaves did have rights think of job's awareness if i mistreat even when they bring a complaint to me no, you know how will not. i deal with god if i mistreat them it's not so sinister people try to make this worse than it is <sighs> It's not so, so sinister. I wrote in our notes here, it's not so sinister. This made my skin crawl. Yeah. Mm. Right. <sighs> so I wrote a note to cite some of the antebellum laws and follow them with, it's not so sinister. Not so sinister. So here we go. George's Constitution in 1798, section 12. I'll just do two. Any person who shall maliciously dismember or deprive a slave of life shall suffer such punishment as would be inflicted in case the like offense had been committed on a free white person and on the like proof, except in case of insurrection by such a slave and unless such death should happen by accident in giving such slave moderate correction guys it's not loophole. so sinister it's not so sinister no it's not a loophole i mean it's not a a, a way of helping the slave owner uh, get out of a pickle in a bad tight spot of getting angry at the slave yeah. north carolina in 1791 quote which distinction of criminality between the murder of a white person and of one who is equally an human creature, but merely of a different complexion, is disgraceful to humanity and degrading in the highest degree to the laws and principles of a free Christian and enlightened country. Be it enacted that if any person shall hereafter be guilty of willfully or maliciously killing a slave, such offender shall upon the first conviction thereof be adjudged guilty of murder and shall suffer the same punishment as if he had killed a free man. Any law, usage, or custom to the contrary notwithstanding. Guys, it's not so sinister. The, the slaves said, had rights. The slaves in the antebellum South had rights. And I'm so you couldn't just treat them that. however you wanted. Now so just so saying. everybody hears us, this is like where our tongues are firmly set in our cheeks here, right? Yeah. The, like the, the, the idea, you can hear, you could make the, I just. You're going to, don't cry, Josh. Ah. Uh, like, but it's like, it, it's gross. Yes. And it's and cool. Gavin is not trying and this is the really no. sad tragic thing about this is Gavin is not trying to be gross here. Not at all. This is what happens to people when they don't understand the text and they don't understand the implications of yep. their uh interpretive models for reading the texts. You know, it it makes people say horrible things by accident. Uh 
and that and I think that's that's probably the worst part about this. It's probably not the worst part, but this is a terrible part about this whole situation, yeah. about this whole argument, right? Um, you know, I, I I can't help but notice like Gavin Gavin brought up the 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 Exodus twenty twenty one rule again about the about knocking out a tooth or or an eye. Um, and I, I bring this up because again, this is something that I, I was in, in, in discussion with, with, with someone on Twitter about just today, yeah. uh, because this gets, ex th this gets extrapolated, right? You can't knock out a tooth and you, if you knock out a tooth or you knock out an eye, the slave has to go free. Ergo, you can't abuse your slave. That's not what the text is saying. Yes, I agree that this is. An Iron Age, ancient Near Eastern form of attempting to protect against abuse. One hundred percent. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of the law. But let's be clear about what's being said in the law. You can't knock out an eye. You can't knock out a tooth. You can't hit him in the face, or you know, you shouldn't be hitting him in the face, right? And if you do, and you get caught, there's a consequence for that. But there's so many ways, so many ways to inflict injury and harm and irreparable, irrevocable abuse on people without knocking out a tooth or an eye. I mean, starvation could be one. Think about There's it. There's no law Just against four, that. You don't get to eat for the next four days, five days. I'm not feeding you because you did this on top of hitting you on your back, your legs, your butt, your feet, whatever other area I can do. You know, imagine, you know, I'm just being totally creative and, and thinking yeah. of ways that other than that, it's not in the text. It's not in my law. You can't imagine people weren't doing it. I'm sure it's there, but I get your point, Josh. And the fact that you came back to Annabellum South to paint the picture I hope, Gavin, if he watches this and anyone who's persuaded or has thought in these kind of ways can see that based on the law, you're not going to walk away. We know from contemporary evidence of the way that the institution of slavery in our own situation, our own backyards, have still to this day impacted society and the way things are, but how horrific that was. And yeah. We aren't there in ancient Israel. We don't. We have very little. We, we have like the text and we have a little archaeology and inscriptions and heuristic ways of looking at other ancient Near Eastern examples and their tablets and text. But we aren't there and pretending that we just got to give a complete glass half full to what the Bible says, because that's our sacred text. And it Job could never be harmful to his slaves. Like we could give him the benefit of the doubt. But does Job represent all of Israel? I mean, even if you said Job was righteous and did good and he wasn't being, you know, like that pretends everybody's like that. And we don't even know, if, like you said, the law, you could do certain things and it's still just and righteous to God based on these laws. It's kind of, I don't know. Do, do you guys remember, uh, Derek may not be old enough, but but Josh, uh, you guys remember that that mini series on, t on TV? Uh, north and south about the uh, about the American I Civil War. It, but... Yeah, yeah. So, like one of the one of the things that, that that made an impression on me watching that as a as a young young person as a young man, I, I might have been a kid when I watched it, was that there was a juxtaposition, right, of the good the good Southern family and then the terrible Southern family, and the good Southern family looked after. They're slaves, you know, they gave them enough to eat. They didn't, they didn't beat them. Um, you know, they, 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 they didn't, they didn't treat them. So, it wasn't so sinister. Yeah. But, you know, I, this is, this is the way, this is the way that, that, that excuse works. Yeah. Mm. All right. Here's another example. In cases where a slave is killed or assaulted by their master, there are severe penalties. So earlier in Exodus 20, 
one, you find it, I'll just read it. It says, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. Now, here's where a lot of problems come up. The Hebrew word for avenged here is talking about the death penalty. And again, that's rare in that historical context. Mark Meinall says, if found guilty, a master was to be punished, which might result in death. That was unheard of at a time when the closest legal equivalents only dealt with assault on other people's slaves. All right. So, I mean, like, I won't read them all again, but, you know, Laws of Hammurabi 16 is doing the, the same thing, <laughs> right? Um, if you have a distraint <clears throat> and the, the slave dies a natural death, um, there's no punishment, right? But if they die from a beating, then there is punishment, and that is that the equal, if it was a, a, a child that was taken as a distraint, then the master's child. In other words, it's, it's, it's a parallel situation, right? So, I mean, like, unheard of at the time is just, sorry, just incorrect. Um, and I don't think he said it yet. I think we have to play a little bit further, but I feel like we've talked about that at least a little bit to this point. Should probably keep pressing to the next thing. But here's the problem. People look at verse 21 and say, oh, how terrible. You mean you can be... I just, I just... I wasn't going to do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I hate these voices, Gavin. I know you don't mean anything by them, but they come across so poorly. Oh, look how terrible. Like, whatever you think about it, whatever defense you're making for it, I think you would still agree that we shouldn't be doing it today, right? So, I like, I don't, I don't, it's, this is just my constructive criticism to you. Um, the voices don't, they don't come across well in this context. Oh, look how terrible that if you beat him to death, just doesn't come across well. So you've spent, more, like you've whole, spent more time. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Traded. Yeah. Right. Sold. It's the Paul Copen thing. And I, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you've spent so much more time on this, uh, Josh, than I have it. Cause I'm, I'm wondering where Gavin is getting his information about the ancient Near Eastern world and, and slavery in the ancient Near East is, does it sound like he's drawing a lot of his stuff from, from Paul Copen? I mean, it sounds like, yeah, I mean, Copan, uh, Maynell, this, this source that he cited, uh, Wright has, Christopher Wright has a whole book that sort of goes right. into this stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's, I'm surprised that he knew Don Demayev, but I, I suspect that somebody else cited Don Demayev just yeah. pulling that section out. I don't know that, but, um, yeah. That's not a place that I would have expected. Should we get to, to should, we, should, should we get to uh, Leviticus twenty five? I mean, he only goes into it for a minute. Yeah, we can kind of press. But, Eat them uh, okay. as much as you want, and as long as they survive, then there's no punishment. But no, it's not perfectly permissible to beat your slave as much as you want, as long as they don't die. This is one of those areas where it's easy to misread these foreign texts. What verse twenty one is saying is there's not to be the death penalty, but that doesn't mean there's no penalty for other physical maltreatment of a slave or a servant. We've talked about this. We can just press through it like maltreatment. Like what is maltreatment? That's an emic category uh, that we're applying an edit category to. And I think that's equivocation. Okay. Th that specific more extreme penalty is not given in that case because it's a less severe crime, but there are, and, and to see that there are penalties, all you do is just read a little bit further and you get to the verses we already looked at, where even knocking out the tooth yeah. of a slave means they go free, okay? So it's it's false to derive from Exodus 21, 21, oh, because you don't get the death penalty, there's no penalty at all. Just a tooth, guys. Uh, I thought that picture was appropriate here. It's totally appropriate. Um, so 
like I, I, everybody should just go look up Proverbs. I'll just read it. Proverbs 29, 19 to 21. By words alone, a slave cannot be corrected since he will understand but not respond. Uh, then there's this sort of odd interlude. Uh, Intervening verse, do you see a man who is hasty with his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. And then 21, a man who pampers his slave from youth, in the end, he, the slave, will be insolent. Here's what uh, Michael Fox says about this 2009 uh, Proverbs commentary. The proverb gives advice for managing a household. Since a slave is deprived of material interests of his own, he must, it was presumed, be beaten into submission like a brute animal or a fool. Slaves were apparently felt to be of qualitatively lower order. Strict treatment of slaves is advised again in 29 to 21. And I just I just want to quickly show you the severity of just knocking out an eye or just knocking out a tooth. Appendix B, which is... that much of the book i go through all the laws on battery in the ancient near east and the hebrew bible here's what we get as penalties for uh a man having his eye damaged or destroyed 30 shekels of silver 60 shekels of silver eye for an eye 20 shekels of silver 40 shekels of silver and then in leviticus uh eye for an eye right for a commoner, which is only really dealt with in the laws of Hammurabi, 60 shekels of silver, which is kind of, seems kind of crazy, but there it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a really big deal to knock out the eye. Uh, for a slave, half the slave's value, which here would be approximately 10 shekels, uh, 10 shekels of silver, 20 shekels of silver, and then in Exodus 21, the debt is repaid or forfeit and the slave is released. Now, to give you an idea of like what uh, 30 shekels of silver means, uh, it's hard to estimate these types of things, but like I did a little calculation, a um, little bit of work, 10 shekels of silver a year seems like a pretty good salary. 10 shekels of silver a year. Knock out an eye, 30 shekels, 60 shekels. Jeez, eh? 40 shekels like yeah um anyway so uh for a tooth 30 shekels 30 shekels i'm looking at different law collections here so the laws of ornama yeah. is 30 laws of yeah. eshnuna 30 laws of hammurabi the and are they set free out. as well huh are they set free as well they, this is just for a man this is for for a man okay um slave is 10 shekels of silver six shekels of silver um and then but the the, the point and, uh in exodus 21 uh, again debt repaid and and set free um it matches up pretty well half the price of a or half the value of a slave is 10 shekels um anyway so the the, the point that i'm trying to make here is this is not a little injury it's one of the top three injuries um yeah. that you see consistently in the law collections so this i cringe every time i hear just even just knock out a tooth it means that you're hitting them in the face in the probably face. with a big stick right it's anyway yeah wow uh, that's probably factors in pretty heavily hey josh does, does your boat i spin around and shit it's water good. no it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> But I do tie them myself, so I feel pretty good about that. Hey, very Those nice. Those are cool. Okay, we're we're we're, okay. we're now at Leviticus twenty-five. Okay, we're not there for long, but but it's really easy to misread these passages or to make them a little more sinister. Uh, let's go to Leviticus 25. This is one of the passages that MindShift is talking about. It's talking about the distinction here between Israelite servants and foreign servants. And the language here, and in other passages as well, for acquiring is not talking about human theft. What are you talking about, Will? <laughs> that, that, that's already been forbidden in Exodus 21. It that was my addition, everybody. <laughs> so that it's clear. 
<laughs> because who is saying that purchasing means they were kidnapped? Uh, uh, who's saying that? I don't know who's saying that. It doesn't even have to mean acquiring yeah. through money. The verb here doesn't have to mean a, a financial per, uh, uh, purchase. Yeah, you can find this same Hebrew verb being used for when uh, uh, a pregnant woman has a child and then she says, I have acquired a child. Or uh, uh, Ruth 4.10 talks about the marriage of Ruth and Boaz like that. Uh, he's so, acquiring a wife. It, it's definitely not talking about a forced course, capture, man stealing, that kind of stuff. So the way like, the way that is, mind shift took that is again stop. more sinister than necessary. You know. um, and and rationality rules video was quite unfair on this point to Paul Copan. Paul Copan is pointing out basically a lot of the language here about property or about acquiring. Um, is not necessarily talking about chattel slavery. And he was making the point that, look, you can use this language in other ways. And he was giving examples today, how we use language like trading sports players and uh, transferring employees. And he gave various examples like this, making a very specific point about the language here. And the, the point is just that that language is underdetermined to tell you the more specific question of whether the servant had any rights. Think of sports players. They are traded. They are sold. They have agents to take care of these transactions, these owners of these franchises. And he had given LeBron James as one example. So then uh, Stephen from Rationality Rules and his guest are just going on and on as though Paul <laughs> Copan were arguing LeBron James is in the same position as an ancient Hebrew servant, which of course was not his point. He was making a more specific focused point about the language. And, and what you can't get out of the language. Oh. And what did you think okay. about that point, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So listen, uh, like I, when I when I watched this the first time, I think I, I mentioned this in the notes too, right? Like his appeal to Ruth four ten <laughs> is curious um, because, like, I'll I'll just I'll just read it quick here. What's happening? Uh, this is. This is uh, uh, Boaz speaking. Uh, Boaz said to the elders and to the rest of the people, you are witnesses today that I am acquiring from Naomi all that belong to uh, Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Mahalon. I am also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the woman of Mahalon, as my woman, so as to perpetuate the name of the deceased upon his estate that the name of the deceased may not disappear from among his kinsmen and from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses to date. Like, did he do that? Did he do that on purpose? Like, did he really, did he, is that, is that the text you want to use here? Like also the Genesis four <laughs> one is funny. Cause that's the one oh. that hollowed puts in a category of the big question mark. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, that's, and that's a wild text. Like, like there's tons of speculation about what's going on in that text because the word kana, which usually means to purchase can also mean to create right in, in, in its cognates in the ancient near Eastern cognates. That's what it means. But, uh, yeah, like in, again, how do we, how do we understand what words mean? We started this stream with this point, Josh. You look at the context, you look at the ways the words are used broadly across as many texts as we can get our hands on. You look at the way the words are used in cognate languages in an effort to get a sense of how to understand what's going on in this context with these prepositions within this certain noun phrase or this construct. How am I going to interpret this word? And like within this context in Leviticus 25, there's just no way to get around this. No. You're buying slaves. Yeah. And I'll just, let, since we're citing Genesis and Ruth, let's just cite some other places where Kana is used. Leviticus yes. 25, 30, right? Uh, purchasing a house. And if it is not purchased back for him within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled cities passes permanently to its purchaser, Kone, throughout well, his generation. I don't know, maybe, not maybe, in the Jubilee. 
you know, maybe maybe someone was pregnant with the house and, and, and acquired the house through pregnancy. Genesis 47, 22, land. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. <laughs> Genesis 49, 30, a field. Uh, and there's tons of these. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham acquired, uh, along with the field from Ephron, the Hittite for a burial site. Genesis 23, 16, which describes this, for 400 shekels of silver. And Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron, the silver which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Het, 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. Two more. Jeremiah 13, 2 and 19, 1, have the purchase of a belt and a jar with this word. Okay, sorry. Specifically when it comes to slaves. Genesis 17, 12, a miknat kesef, which is the purchase of silver for a slave. And let all your males, whether they are eight, uh, when they are eight days old, be circumcised throughout your generations. The house born and the one purchased with silver, miknat kesef, from every foreigner, those who are not of your offspring. Exodus 12, 44, the same. Ecclesiastes 2, 7, and I'll shut up. I bought male and female slaves, and I had houseborn slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. And sorry, I'll say this here. Chun Leong Seau in his 2008 uh, work on the verb kana is used for the buying of slaves. And he cites Genesis 39.1, 47.23, Amos 8.6, and Nehemiah 5.8. It means buying people. I dropped my mic if it wasn't yep. uh, attached to my mic stand here, guys. And so expensive. Like, <laughs> it's so expensive. Right? You would know, buddy. Uh, yeah. uh, but, like, so just so everyone understands here, too, uh, the reason why um, you can't just, you can't just, just soften this with, with attempting to uh, use a gloss like in English, like a choir to make it less sinister because within Leviticus, within Leviticus 25 specifically, but in all of these other texts, which deal with, um, with slaves, these are all part of larger law collections concerned with property, concerned with the, the heritage of the Israelites with the Nahla or or the Ahuza. Um, and for that reason, uh, you know, the these these texts are when you read them correctly and contextually and you understand what's going on, they're the writers are being very careful to ensure that uh th that basically all the balances are 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 level. Um it's the this is property law, which is where slaves in this mindset belong. Now, if you want to know for sure that Leviticus 25 is not talking about race based chattel slavery, just keep reading. Right after those verses, you see the exact opposite scenario can come about. If the sojourner becomes wealthy, the Israelite can sell himself into servanthood to that person. I'll just read it for us. Leviticus 25, 47, 48. If a stranger or sojourner with you becomes rich and your brother beside him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner with you or to a member of the stranger's clan, then after he is sold, he may be redeemed. Actually, many of the commentators use this verse to show that foreign slaves could become free. They could work their way to independence because that's disputed. Yeah, I just wanted to know what commentators he's referring to. Because I would like to have a conversation with them. <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> so I actually wrote, Com commentators argued that these verses show that foreign slaves could work their way to freedom. What the actual fuck? I am so sick of this nonsense. Let's just destroy this by simply explaining what's going on. That's what I wrote in my notes. Um, okay.
sorry. I I just like how many times have we explained this? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Leviticus 25 is talking about amongst other things um jubilee, right? And it's saying that for Israelites there is a period of time that can elapse or that will elapse and at the end of that period of time all debts will be canceled um and all people will be returned to their property, right? It's a big reset button for Israelites, just for Israelites. In light of that, the text talks about what if a fellow Israelite becomes poor? How do you take care of them? And there are different stages to their falling into poverty. The final one is that they would try to sell themselves into slavery to you. The Holiness Code in, Levit Code in Leviticus 25 says you can't do that anymore. You have to treat them as a hired worker. Then, sort of, parenthetical thing well where do we get slaves from 44 to 46 they come from the nations around you or tenant farmers that are living in your midst keep them for life pass them down as inheritance i know the verses that we're not really dealing with here no mention of ahuza no mention of the inheritance no mention of even yeah. verse 46 of the serving forever anyway um then we just jump to 47 47 to 55 is you have a group of people called the Toshavim. The Toshavim, it's not a straightforward term, but it seems to indicate people that are foreigners living in the land of Canaan. Since they don't have land, they rent out fields from Israelites. These are tenant farmers, is the way this gets translated often. Mm -hmm. So, you have tenant farmers in the land. 40, 40, 46 says if you want to get uh, slaves, you either got to get them from the nations around or from this group called the Toshavim, tenant farmers that are living in the land of Israel. You can get permanent slaves there. But that doesn't mean that everybody that's a Toshav is a slave. That's not what that means. So, like, read a comment. I'm sorry. Just read a commentary. Anyway, okay. A Toshav could either do very poorly or could do very well. If Kip, if you are, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm just talking and talking and talking. No, it's you, man. It's um, you wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, people read it. Um, so, so let's say you're the Israelite. Um, Kip and and I get to be the Israelite. Own, All right, there you go. Um, and and you own ten acres of land, and I am a foreigner. Oh. I can't own land, but I'm living in the land. And I say, hey, I will pay you five shekels of silver a year to rent out um, two acres of your land, yeah. and I give will me, grow give my, me my money, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now, one of two things could happen, right? I mean, at least one of two things. Mm -hmm. One of at least two things. I could do very poorly and default on my, my rent to you, right? Or not. And if I do, then I might become your debt slave. And that could convert into chattel slavery. You don't have to release me after uh, the Jubilee or at the Jubilee. It's not so sinister at my house, Josh. But it's not so sinister. Um, however, I could also do really well. Let's say I have great crop years. And I take this two acres and, man, I really start doing something with it, right? And I'm selling the grain and I'm putting stuff away. And, I'm, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing well. I can rent out five more acres from you, right? And, and maybe I can rent out all your acreage from you because maybe you're not doing so well. I don't know. The, the, the point is that I start doing so well, I start making lots of money. And now I am wealthy enough to start making loans to Israelites. And Israelites fall into debt slavery with me. What does the law say about that? We've dealt with what happens if an Israelite falls into a position of potential slavery with another Israelite. But what happens if this occurs with a Toshav who's living in the midst? This is not the same person. Get it through your heads, everybody. The Toshav in 44 to 46 is not the Toshav in 47 to 55, right? It's not the same. It's not some guy named Frank. Frank the Toshav. 
right? And he becomes a slave for a while. Then he's he's manumitted. He gets out and he becomes really wealthy. That's not what's happening here. It's saying you have a group of people. Yep. Some of that group of people could do poorly. They can be kept for life. They don't have to do poorly at all, but whatever. Um, or this group uh, of the Toshavim could do well, and that group uh, could take their own slaves. What does the law say about that? That's what's going on here. Um, also, he seems to think the Jubilee is every seven years. I didn't understand that. I think it's just a conflation of Deuteronomy 15, but I think maybe he so. just misspoke. I don't know, but it sounded like that I to think me. So. Yeah. But I thought I thought that was that was very clear, Josh. Uh, the way you explained that. So, and I, I I don't know does he does he talk about about the the gear and and needing to treat the gear uh, well? Yeah, I think that comes was, up. Does he does? Okay, all right. Well, let's uh, let's try and get there. Oh, yeah. Did you press it? But the point is, slavery in the Old Testament is not chattel slavery. It's not rooted in racism. People say that too. Okay, um, it's true that there is preference given for fellow Israelites, but the differences between an Israelite and a non-Israelite are not just about race. It's about their whole citizenship and nationality. And there were differences in how Israelite servants and foreign servants are treated. But the differences are not absolute. The main difference seems to be with the Jubilee year principle. So every seven years, Deuteronomy 15 says. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Yeah, it's, maybe he, it's it may just be a right? mis. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe. he's just saying yeah. every seven years in Deuteronomy 15. It just might be the wording. Yeah, could be. You send your servants away. You don't send them away empty-handed. That seems to be applying to Hebrew servants specifically, not foreign servants. But that doesn't mean that foreign servants or foreign slaves could never be freed. That certainly happened sometimes. One of the things that would... Yeah, I just wanted to point out the 1949. Like, there's a lot that's been written since Mendelssohn's work in 49. I'm not saying you should <laughs> never cite it, but I mean, like, there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Happened a lot is some servants would be adopted by their master in their final years, adopted, and then set free upon the master's death. So that can happen. I also am skeptical that he dug Mendelssohn's 49 publication out. I can found that on his own. He, I he probably that he's found that. that in another citation. Yeah. Yeah. But, and that's fine. That's fine. I just like, there are better resources. But for foreign slaves, it's not regulated every seventh year like this, as it was for Israelite servants. However, all the other pointed laws that out. protecting the servant are not just applicable to the Israelite servants. They're applicable to all servants, including foreign servants or foreign slaves. Yeah, see, I, I don't... <laughs> he's going to go into this a little more. Maybe I'll wait for that. We're getting close to the end. Um, but this is sure Israelites have to be released and foreign slaves don't, but I, I don't know. Like that just let's make this let's, yeah, let's make this not look as bad as it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty big it's a pretty it's big a pretty big, big thing to have a before butt. a butt. Yeah, it sure is. I like big butts in a sorry. <laughs> all the servants and slaves had protections had rights as Sklar puts it servants from the nations enjoyed the same legal protections given to all servants such as freedom if severely beaten and the right to rest on the sabbath yeah i mean i just don't know that exodus 21 20 to 21 um it depends i guess it depends on what he's trying to say here if we're trying to make sort of a a connection here between Leviticus twenty five, like that's 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 not the case, right? But because um, it's a different it's a different section of the law. Yeah, class, yeah. I don't know. Given that I was the foreign sorry, slaves would all, um, um, I was going to say, given that Exodus twenty one seems pretty exclusive to you know, Hebrew uh, debt slaves. It seems like a safe bet that that's what that that rule is is applied to. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at, at best, it's to debt slaves in general. Right. Right. But I don't yeah. like I this is this is not something, for example, that's applicable to chattel slaves. Sure not clear, that's for sure. Also partake of the Passover and other Israelite feasts. Um, the, none of these laws made a distinction between with the New Testament oh portrayal. Sorry. I meant to hit pause, not. Oh. But what if somebody said to you, hey, wait a second, like in the antebellum South, slaves are allowed to go to church on Sundays. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry. I just always... It's true. Circumcision, Passover, Sabbath. Cattle were allowed to observe the Sabbath too, right? So I mean, yeah. this isn't a... <laughs> That's I think true. This is, this is probably right. less about the humanity of the slave and more about, hey, you can't... I don't want you working on the Sabbath. So you can't even send your slave out to do your bidding for you. It's. It seems even like it's rooted in... I would use the term superstition about their particular ritual cultic practices and how they they kept getting rewarded if they obeyed the deity. So the the deity being supreme, how do we honor that deity and make sure even to the point where the animals aren't even doing anything? So I'm not going to say there yeah. couldn't have been respect toward the human in some ways, but like, I don't know. Yeah. Should bring that back. Sorry. Um, okay. The foreign slaves would also partake of the Passover and other Israelite feasts. Um, the, none of these laws made a distinction between some kinds of slaves versus others. All right. Now, now one other challenging passage is people talk about sexual slavery, and they'll bring up Deuteronomy 21. And what we have to understand here is the cultural context and what would typically be done. Here again, I want us, I want us to see how the Hebrew Bible is progressing. It's, it's, putting, it's putting things in the right direction, okay? The rituals during this 30-day period are not designed to humiliate her. These are uh, purification rituals. They're not meant to be, it's about ritual purity. They're not meant to be demeaning or something like that. And it's giving a period of time to protect oh. her. Okay, look, that the purpose of that law was because the common practice at that time would have been for women to be raped in that circumstance. And uh, what do you they're, they're think is happening they're, they might be as, just, in this as good circumstance as at that point in that at that time in history, if their husband has just been killed. Uh. And so the law is pushing against that and saying, no, you have to marry this person and you have to wait this amount of time. It's trying to push against the general practice at that time. First of all, their husband yeah. has just been killed no sir they have just killed her husband I right? there's a pretty big difference between those like what Secondly, you just said isn't sinking in i don't think i don't think yeah i can't even imagine what that would be like for that woman or anyone for that matter like we talk about this elsewhere um, but like that 30 days probably has absolutely nothing to do with her save, uh, wanting to make sure that she has a menstrual cycle. Right. Yeah. Um, can I, uh, yeah, please. Can I read this, uh, this, this, yeah, yeah. this selection from, um, um, uh, Rory Cox, I think is really good. Uh, that speaks specifically to this, right? Uh, they say, rather than expressing humanitarian concerns, the restrictions detailed in Deuteronomy 21 may have originated as a form of taboo, during which time the foreign captive was purified. The woman had to discard her captive guard and alter her physical appearance in order to be safely integrated into the Israelite religious community. In other words, the taboo period was not designed with the mental or physical well-being of the captive in mind. Rather, the taboo period fulfilled a socio-religious function rooted in a concern for the purity and homogeneity of the Israelite community. It also ensured the familial honor of the male captor. 
The waiting period prior to the commencement of sexual relations was used to confirm that the woman was not already pregnant, thus guaranteeing that any future children were indeed sired by the captive's new master. Right? Does everybody Hmm. hear what's going on here? Uh, And importantly, like this is all... This is all stuff that that the text is very specific here. It's explicit that this is all stuff that the man does to his new captive. He's the one who trims her nail and shaves her head and dresses her in in uh, in mourners uh, garb. This is this is humiliating. Like this is a way of this is just another way of othering a person from the rest of the community there's nothing there's there's nothing there's nothing there's nothing good here right i mean let's just say that it really isn't there's no like there's no justification that really honestly i would try to just ignore (laughs) or admit it's bad and it's ugly not try to soften the blow in some way or try to pretend it's not as ugly as it is that's it's just i don't know yeah it's sad and kip as you said like the idea that this is not rape <laughs> right it's fundamentally <laughs> like, flawed it's, it's it is it is um anybody who hasn't uh seen it or read it i just i just picked it up i've been working through it uh for my own book our colleague jennifer Jennifer bird's marriage in the bible uh will will change your perspective on uh on what the laws in the bible are doing with regards to and and conventions within the bible are doing with regards to women and the relationships with men I, I do um, I do have a practical question. It's not long. It's just like almost like everyone let it sink in. Your husband just died. 30 mm-hmm. days later, you have to have sex with this guy. Willingly, yep. happily, joyfully? You think you're Relevant. really sharing that bed in what we in our modern sensibilities and our and our partners who choose to be with us and love us and can dump us and leave us for someone else at any time kind of? No, no. But it's not rape. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Uh, but importantly, let's let's point out also that this was just the this was just the station of women, right? In in this this ancient Near Eastern culture, regardless of whether um, she was a war captive or even a member of the community to begin with, um, as Jennifer Bird points out in her book. Uh, the way a man, the, the the word in the Bible most consistently used for what, what we interpret as marriage is taking. And that's exactly what a man does. Men take women. Men give women to other men. Uh, and the way that you consummate this arrangement is through is through sexual intercourse. Hmm. She doesn't, I mean, it's not like she's got much of a say in this arrangement at all. All right. Getting close, people. All right. What is sometimes missed when we come from a modern Western framework and read these laws is the sense of progress being made here relative to ancient history in general. Here's how one scholar puts it. The norms given in the Book of the Covenant reveal, when compared with related law books in the ancient Near East, radical alterations in legal practice, in the evaluation of offenses against property, in the treatment of slaves, in the fixing of punishment for indirect offenses, and in the rejection of punishment by mutilation, the value of human life is recognized as incomparably greater than all material values. Take the principle of the Jubilee year. I mean, that uh, one commentator calls that probably the most radical social and economic idea in all the Bible. Another says it enshrined in law the cessation of land abuse, the cancellation of debts, the restitution of land to its original owners, the repair of the family, and the termination of slavery. The design of this law 
is as a safety net for the vulnerable. It's trying to stop generational cycles of poverty. In Deuteronomy 15, you can see that's the explicit purpose. They're trying to regulate an already existing institution with the overarching goal of reducing poverty. All right. Um, I cannot believe I forgot to, I just grabbed a screenshot like I did. And I cannot remember who wrote the article. Just terrible. Um, but here's uh, a little bit about law and social welfare in the wider ancient Near East. Um, so there was recognition both in Israel and in the ancient Near East of social problems and dislocations caused by economic disparities and hardships. Especially severe was the problem of debt, which could force an individual to give up his property, home, fields, and eventually his own freedom. There is evidence in the laws of attempts to address these social and economic problems through relief, giving measures and regulations. The rights of a borrower with respect to items of his property pledged to his creditor are the subject of laws in the Bible, Exodus 22, Deuteronomy 24, and so on, and in the ancient Arias, Code of Hammurabi. Uh, and I won't list them all out. Um, there is concern about persons who are distrained or enslaved because of their debts, such as a person who must be released after six years in the Bible, Exodus 21, Deuteronomy 15, and after three years in Babylonia, Code of Hammurabi 117. Did you and just say after three years? Yeah. So it's half the time. Yeah. And it's twice as old, if not more. But it was it was very progressive. Oh, very progressive. It was yeah. a redemptive movement. <laughs> wow. Go yeah. Asher. I guess it'd be Marduk. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was reading Assyrian laws, so that's... Uh, anyway, in the Assyrian laws and in the Bible, one finds attempts to mitigate the consequences of debt slavery for unmarried women. There are laws aimed at preventing the ill treatment of individuals, free or slave, who are left in pledge. Laws of Eshnuna 22 to 24, Code of Hammurabi. Uh, the, the Bible, too, has laws bearing on the ill treatment of distrained purpose, uh, persons. Leviticus 25, 39, 43, 53... And one may also look to Exodus 21, 20 to 21, 26, 27 as a piece of larger social policy protecting all types of slaves. Deuteronomy 23, 15 to 16 departs from the other ancient Near Eastern law collections by forbidding the return of a fugitive slave to his master. The Near Eastern laws consider return to be a duty. Of course, mm. I disagree. Mm. Uh, mm. Well, I don't necessarily disagree. I just he's not, I don't know that he knew, the writer knew about it. Law 87. Anyway, mm -hmm. we're tied that together. Um, redemption and release. Property, uh, I, I'll stop here. Um, property and persons who passed out of the possession of debtors and into the hands of creditors could often be redeemed. Cites tons of sources from the law collections and from Leviticus 25. Otherwise, uh, the forfeiture of sale became final, but even in such cases, there was relief in the form of a periodic jubilee or years of release when properties might go back to the original owners. In the Bible, this event is termed Doror or Yovel. Uh, while the release of persons came after six years of servitude, the release of property was periodically set to occur every 50 years. Uh, in Mesopotamian sources, one finds an array of terms designating release, most importantly, Sumerian Amar uh, Gifor, uh, Nigtu Sisatu, uh, and their Akkadian counterparts. Doesn't matter what they are. Anyway. Uh, these releases were most often associated with the accession of a new king or, uh, or his jubilee, um, celebrated sometimes decades later. Typically, the release affected uh, relief for various unpaid taxes on lands and harvest, cancellation of outstanding debts, discharge of debt hostages and slaves, annulment of property sales due to debts, and recompense for their loss. In other words, it's not just in the Bible. And I, I won't read it, but I have one of the edicts here of Amisa Duca. But anyway, it's not just in the Bible, guys. We're almost there. Sorry. I, I, I could summarize like this. If you read through books like Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and you have an open mind, two things will become clear. Number one, this is the ancient world. Okay, this is not a, a timeless ideal. Number two, this is not tyrannical and malevolent. 
this is, you can see this as uh, coming out of Genesis 1 and the doctrine of the image of God. It's trying to curb against the abuses that existed in the world at that time. And that's the great theme if you step back and see the big picture of the Old Testament law over and over and over. If there's anything that is hammered away at in the law of Moses, it's that you were slaves in Egypt. So uh, treat the sojourner among you with compassion. Look out for them. I'll, I'll put up a few examples of this on the screen. Sorry, or did you do that? Did we lose Are you it? muted? Audio? I am muted. Sorry. Oh, okay. Did did you take it off the screen or did I? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I was looking at um, the Hebrew word. Oh, all right. Um, if uh, did you want to? Did yeah. you want to pause there? Or oh, did sorry. You, okay. Yeah, I. Uh, I just wrote here in the notes. Discuss how this is not incompatible with slavery. Clearly, right. Um. So again, as you pointed out earlier, in the in the broader ancient Near East, this is the way kings functioned, right? Mm -hmm. You you care for the oppressed, you care for the vulnerable, you care for the weak, um, you care for the foreigner. I, it is it, it is clear that the Hebrew Bible appends to this uh, this notion of because you were foreigners or you were slaves, right? There's no question about that. Um, but that doesn't mean one that they then thought this is incompatible with keeping people as slaves because it's not. Um, and it's not that they didn't care about the, the vulnerable uh, in the, in the wider engineer East as well. No. Uh, and can we be clear about this? Because this often gets, you know, this, this idea of um, Yahweh or God delivering the Israelites out of, out of bondage in Egypt is this great story of emancipation, right? Like this is how Cecil B. DeMille um, painted the picture in his classic film. Uh, it's very important for people to understand what's going on in this text and why uh, the, the laws keep coming back to this point. You know, you don't mistreat the gear because you were gears in Egypt, right? And the point is, you were in this, this station as free uh, landholders in Egypt. Uh, and you were taken, you were wrongly taken from that station and put into slavery. And Yahweh makes this explicit uh, later on in, uh, in Exodus 25, after he's gone through the whole Jubilee period uh, laws, he finishes up by saying, you are my slaves, right? And this is why this was the problem. The problem wasn't slavery. The problem was Egypt had wrongfully enslaved Yahweh slaves, which Yahweh wasn't happy about. And that's why he took them back, because they belonged to him. They did not belong to Egypt. And as a reminder, don't you do that to other people who don't rightfully belong to you. And I put the stress on rightfully here, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's who the Ger is. The Ger is someone who, who is, is, is living in your land and enjoys some, some privilege and protection in this sense. I've always thought it was weird. God puts them in Egypt. Like he, he, mm -hmm. It's all part of his plan to make them go to Egypt to become slaves. But then we got to thank him for helping us get out. It's like, you put us in here. Can you imagine a parent? You know, hey, I'm going to send you down here. You're going to go through some of the worst, most horrific things. But better thank me, too, when I let you out. Oh, and you almost didn't get all the way out. I had to kill a lot of you on the way out because you just yeah. weren't doing things the way I told you to do. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So how are we doing, Josh? Is there yeah. some more here to finish up? And then we'll... Uh... Yeah, last... last. Uh, so the, uh, when you see the big picture like that, it, it might help you uh, kind of see the biblical story in its overarching development. All right, let's keep moving in that development, get to the New Testament. This will be more brief. All right, so that's, that's it. <laughs> um, I just... <sighs> 
I don't know. Do, should, do we even want to co- comment on him? I mean, like, First Timothy 1, 9 to 10, he's going to talk about this. It it doesn't say slave, the social institution of slavery is wrong. It's talking about um, an illegal practice of slave traders. Galatians 3, 28 mm-hmm. is a spiritual. Um, but again, I just, you know what? I just refer people to Jennifer Glancy's book. We've been going for three hours. Yeah. It's very um, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I think, I mean, I, I, I think we've, we've, we've fairly, um, comprehensively covered, uh, the many problems appear in, with, in, uh, Gavin's video insofar as we understand the old Testament and the slave laws relative to what's going on in the ancient Near East. And he clearly for no, again, you know, for no fault of his own, he clearly doesn't have as strong a grasp on the literature and the period um, as 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 maybe he should. I, I, I'm uh, not going to blame I'm, him I'm, completely, though, because yeah. these scholars no. he's quoting to seem to be regurgitating the same stuff from other in the same vein, it seems. They're just keeping the same ideas floating around from book and, to book. And and hey, look, like uh, let's let's take um, let's take uh, Leviticus twenty five forty seven to fifty five. Like let's say because uh, he cited that it's it's debated, right? I haven't seen that, mm-hmm. um, but let's say that it is right. And let's say uh, that 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 becomes clear somehow through the text uh, that. This is a Toshav. It is the same Toshav in 44 to 46. That doesn't make sense to me in the context of the passage, but let's just go with it, mm-hmm. right, for the sake of argument. What does that get you, right? Um, like, I just, I don't know what that, I don't know what that gets you. Uh, so, so, so a foreign slave could be manumitted if the owner wanted him to be manumitted? I mean, there, there was a law, right, to manumit people in the Roman period, like, I don't, or maybe not a law, but there was a um, a common a provision in the thirties, right? So what? There's so, no slavery in Rome. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, sorry. So we can do. Uh, I let everyone know I got to go soon, just so that they, yeah, are, you know what I mean. So should we should we hit these these super chats and, yeah, and yeah. shut it down? And and thank you, Josh, so much for putting the work into this, uh, oh, and sure. you know not just yeah, not man. just for this stream, but for all the years that you have poured into uh, those excellent books. Uh, and everyone, please uh, go if you haven't already buy Josh's second edition on uh, biblical slavery. It's excellent. Uh, it's as far as I know, it's like the only place where you can get a, a, a comprehensive collection of all the ancient Near Eastern materials like that, just yeah. in one place. Right. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's hit some of these super chats and then we're going to have to get out of here. Uh, our friend Pat Lowinger over at discovering ancient history with Pat Lowinger. Thank you for the $5 super chat. Can we discuss a preliminary study of the Sumerian curricular and lamentational texts from the old Babylonian city of Kish instead of slavery? You know this what? is how Josh enters every stream, I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, most conversations in my life, you know, um, <laughs> this is the title of my yeah. dissertation, everybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's more clear. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Pat. Uh, you I, I haven't read it. Sorry. Uh, so. Yeah, don't blame me. Oh, Ichabod. Oh. Thank you for the uh, $5 super chat. A down payment nice. on Kip's book. Yay. Thanks for giving Brady's us a preview. The man. You're welcome. Uh, Apostate of Mind podcast. My friend, Mark Peralta. Uh, regarding the Imago Dei, are there any clues in the text to specify that likeness is ontological and not just physical appearance? Uh, I would say no. Yeah. Um, that's anachronistic. Yeah, that's a philosophy type thing. And I did a little bit of I did a little bit of digging in this beyond just the the Hebrew Bible text. Uh, you know, I looked at the ways because I think this is ultimately more of a a a later uh, late Second Temple Jewish development. I think Philo probably has some reflection on this. Uh, this is a a later Christian 
development and, you know, rabbinic Jewish development, certainly. But importantly, one of the things that we do see is in the New Testament, uh, where there is reflection on Genesis 1, 26, this idea of the Imago Dei, it's not, uh, it, it's also not ontological. I went through a bunch of the texts and, and it's, it's, it, it's, 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 uh, it's very vague. Um, it's, it's never applied in the same sense that it is by, by, uh, later, uh, Christian apologists. But, uh, thank you, Mark, for the super chat. Um, what's next? I heart dogs. I think this is over at your channel, Derek. Thanks for, uh, thanks to critical scholarship. I am loving the Bible even more as an atheist than I did as an evangelical Christian. I'm wanting that. I want them not to just hate it and 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 create more of an interest from a secular humanist, uh, the humanities kind of angle, rather than the polemics. I I get caught up in the polemics. People like to see a fight, but I love not just the Bible, but I love the ancient you know literature and the good, the bad, the ugly to learn from, understand where we came from, not to repeat it. You know, call a spade a spade. Anyway, thank you, I Heart Dogs. Yeah. Thank you, I Heart Dogs. Scott Duke, also over on your channel. Derek, uh, thank you for the super chat. Haven't been able to super chat in a while. Love the bow tie. Thank you you. Look, you look badass now that you've kind of, you know, <laughs> loosened the tie, taken the jacket here. off. I, <laughs> I know. It's, it's, uh, it's the lights and it's the computer screen. It's hot in here, mm. too. So... Yeah, uh, Sarah M. Hughes, thank you all the way from uh, New Zealand. I do love to hear a scholar passionately speaking on a topic they care about. Totally boss, totally boss. and all right, you know, if I got the too right, up. the right usage of the term, too. Very nice, indeed. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I mean, if you haven't noticed, this is something that uh, that that Josh and I and Derek are all very passionate about, and we love. Um, you know, it's, it's a joy to be able to, to talk about the, the texts and the culture and the history with you people. Uh, Irene Cooper, uh, also over at your channel, Derek, thank you for the $5 super chat. Guess they weren't oh, considered wow. humans before that decree. That's Love on what y'all are doing. That's on your channel. Are you sure? Isn't it? I, I think, think, oh, so. maybe that's on, oh no, that's, I think that's on, uh, Josh's channel. Ah. I think that's a digital Hammurabi super chat. I don't know how to tell. Nice. <laughs> I, I, I I can't exactly tell either. I just know which ones are mine. Well, uh, so, so sweet. Yeah. I can see which ones are mine. There's a chain yeah. link thingy. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's what I see too. So well, we, um, love, we love what you're your support and we appreciate it. Seriously. Absolutely. Michael Apple, thank you for the five dollars super chat. Five dollars for Dr. Josh's anti-slavery <laughs> ain't slavery because kidnapping is a legal argument ain't slavery because it, kidnapping oh is God. a legal argument added to the arsenal uh, <laughs> premise one <laughs> that's it word you got it michael all right just a few more guys uh blake was cyrus the first to abolish slavery in 539 bce and i honestly don't know yeah, um, did he abolish, abolish slavery? I'm not sure if that's right. Ah, uh, that's something I feel like now I, I gotta go to look, do. Blake. Yeah, thanks for Way giving to go, me Blake. more work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thanks for the super chat. Uh, I'm not reading that one. Modular Buffalo for ten dollars. Thank you very much for the super chat. I want to thank you for all the work that you do. I used to be like Gavin, but you guys helped me realize the mental gymnastics to justify it. All are crazy. No um, longer a slave to Mick apologetics. <laughs> awesome. Mick, that is the Mick being Mick sticking, guys. It's it is. Really it is. is. It really it's is. Fun. Thank you. That's awesome. So, but thank you very much, Modular Buffalo. That's uh, awesome. Very much appreciated. And congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Rennie Madden for five Canadian dollars off the top. Gavin says his intent is to sensitize Christians to the issue of slavery in the Bible. 
do we think he was successful in that endeavor? So listen, uh, w when I when this when I first saw this video, um, and and then I went on to onto Twitter, there was an awful lot of people who really thought that this was a a, a convincing case hmm. that uh, that Gavin presented for uh, biblical slavery, which actually kind of heightened the urgency um, mm. on my part, I think on, on, uh, on our part to, to set the record straight about a lot of yeah. this stuff. Cause let's be honest. I, I think when, especially when you are starting from a position of, uh, sympathy and you, when you've got a lot invested into your own ideas and your own, uh, uh hermeneutical framework of the text, uh, this sounds convincing. If you don't know the material, if you don't know the scholarship, and he's pulling up these arguments and this stuff, and 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 he's cobbling together a story and an argument that makes sense, right? I mean, until you kind of drill down into it. Um, so it, uh, to answer your question, do I think he was successful? Unfortunately, I think he probably was, uh, mm -hmm. which is why a stream like this is important. Do you guys have anything else? I would say if he was... Be in my opinion is if he's successful from our perception of trying to do something that we would say is good, there was maybe sprinkles in there, but overall, I think that it was an apologetic again, geared at um, special pleading the Bible over all ancient near Eastern context in light of slavery. Uh, this is the special one. This is the one, and this is our guide and we need to defend the guide at all costs. That's kind of the implications I got from it even though he was trying to go to sources or say, this is what this says. And this is what this says. But, uh, that was my takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. Claude Simeon for $5. Josh is wrong. Monk isn't always right. The stench of trash affected him. He was sick. He took one. <laughs> extra. That is a extra fair support. point. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Damn. Now say wrong theory. Was, yep. Yeah. The, uh, the, the argument was valid, but not sound. Mm. It was. Um, Great sorry. show, though. We'll have to re-record <laughs> your testimony now. This isn't going to work. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Right? Oh, Chrissy H is in the house. Mm -hmm. No questions. Just saying hi and sorry I'm late again. Kip, don't kill me. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it's kind of what I do. So. Exactly. exactly. Good to see you, Chrissy. I got one more, guys, and then uh, we can shut it down. Eleanor Deal. How should devout Christians approach slavery well? Good question. I, if you don't mind, I, I'll take this one. Um, yeah, you do it. I think that we need to be honest about our interpretive models and maybe honest with ourselves about them. And that's where I hope that I can sort of motivate people to get or to move uh, toward. When I read the Epic of Gilgamesh, I'm not bothered by, um, you know, things that I would consider to be immoral today that appear in there from, from the perspective that people are bothered by things in the Hebrew Bible, because I don't see it as a moral guide to me. In other words, I'm not trying to de derive my ethical system from the Epic of Gilgamesh or from the Tukulti Norta Epic or from any ancient text, right? Mm. What I'm doing is I'm, so I'm filtering the text through what, uh, I can't remember where I heard it. it might've been my father. He used to call it the rake and shovel method. You guys ever heard that? You know, you, I have. you, rake, in, you rake in the good stuff out of the pile and you shovel out the bad, mm. right? It's another way of cherry picking, right? Yeah. But, this is how we we approach ancient texts and as a matter of fact i think we do this with the hebrew bible as well we just don't realize it and the reason that we have apologetics for things like this is because we're doing that right we're saying Ew, like that that can't be right this idea must be shoveled out we must have an apologetic that explains why it is there and i think that instead what we ought to be doing is is maybe moving away from this inspired and errant view of the text and saying, look, as an ancient text, if we want to say that um, it's divinely inspired in the sense that 
uh, people were moved to write about their engagement with the numinous, uh, you know, or with the divine, whatever, that's, that's fine. And, and so, you know, we can, you know, engage with their experience and in the same way that we engaged with, you know, Neo-Syrian writings and how they engaged with what they consider to be the divine and garner things like, you know, pull things from it that are applicable to our lives as well through that lens. Um, and I think that's what I would say about slavery. And so in that case, you know, uh, I think the Bible would be perfect uh, for something like stepping back and seeing these broader pictures and understanding things um, in, in a way that sort of, all right, obviously we're not going to care about laws from like the ancient world, right? That's mm -hmm. the, But look here, Jesus is talking about, you know, setting the prisoners free, setting the captives free. And this idea of freedom is good. And the, the Exodus mm -hmm. story is one about chosen people. And so, yeah, I mean, through my interpretive lens, it seems like being free is a good thing. Yeah. Right. And so that's, that's my takeaway, right? It's a reader response theory. And I think that's good. That's mm -hmm. what I would, that's what I would want. I, I like what Chrissy H said in the chat, condemn it. Obviously, if it's saying what it's saying, condemn it, realize it is bad, realize that Christianity contributed, see what you can do to honestly engage the issue. And of course, I imagine modern Christians in our context that we're, we're talking about aren't doing it anymore. And so grow out of it, learn from it. Uh, permission granted jennifer bird says you know like say that was bad yeah. no more let's go forward in the spirit of i don't think i think this is the the direction that if jesus were to come today or at the pivotal point he would have been one of those possible revolutionaries i don't know like you said reader response kind of reading into it that kind of idea motives of, of salvation of freedom things like that but not trying to paint over an ugly picture and pretend that it had nothing to do with those things at all. And just being dishonest with the material and engaging in the, in, in the literature, that's what we're calling out. We're saying, no, 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 you're trying to act like this is the facts. And these, this is the, this is what the evidence is. No, that's just being dishonest with history and the literature and your special pleading your case in a, in a, in a way that's dishonest. Anyway, I yeah. rambled there. So, I think that's good. I think that's good, everyone. Listen, uh, it's almost uh, it's almost eight fifteen. I shudder to think how late it is over on on Josh's side of the country. Uh, thanks, guys, for hanging out with us for this long for uh, watching the stream. Uh, Gavin Ortland, if you see this, I I really hope that uh that you take us up on the uh on on the open invitation uh come talk to us about uh about some of this stuff um our goal is is really in the end to to, to provide clarity and uh and direction with regards to to what the text says and what it means um so yeah i think i think with that uh we can shut it down you guys have anything else just one super just, chat of Chris H. Oh, last second. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll just grab that quickly. Um, my serious take as a religious person: don't take your religious text seriously. You lose sight of humanity or limit deity on the base of ancient words. Very well said, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Um, nice. I'm going to be back. Josh is going to be back on Sunday for a shorter stream uh sunday sunday afternoon at 11 a.m pacific time the diablo critics are back for episode three i hope everyone tunes in uh until then thanks everybody good night, love everyone have a good and happy friday uh mm -hmm. I, i'm i'm finding an outro <laughs>